It looks like everyone knows who I am, yet I don't know any of you. That hardly seems fair. Han San smiled at the people in front of him. I cannot believe we stumbled across you here. This truly is perfect. Manager Chu had murder in his eyes. He looked at the people around him, and they spread out to surround Han San. There were seven of them, and they looked to be elites who had opened their gene locks. Furthermore, they were all under the effects of the drug. They possessed an unnatural power, and they were clearly preparing themselves to kill Han San. Han San, summon your super pet. It's about time we demonstrate to you that super pets aren't that good. The leader, Manager Chu, looked to be seething with rage as he coldly spoke to Han San. Super pets aren't good, you're right, they're brilliant. But I don't need a super pet to deal with you guys. Han San summoned the flaming wreck spike in his hands. Han San wanted to see how strong the people truly were, having used the Shura concoction. Good. Show us how talented you are. Manager Chu seemed genuinely excited and very confident in his ability to kill Han San before he summoned a super pet. It would be better if they did not have to fight the super pet. Without any hesitation, Manager Chu swung his sword as fire erupted from the blade and wreathed it. Then, he rushed towards Han San. The other six people, who were Bloodhorn Shura, had their elemental powers primed. They all raced towards Han San looking as if they wanted to kill him quickly before he summoned his super pet. They seemed to be really confident about killing Han Sen, and as a matter of fact, they had already formulated a plan for killing him beforehand. They had learned it on the off chance they would one day encounter him again. But their plan included what they should do to deal with the little angel at the same time. Now that they did not have to deal with the little angel right away, their confidence was bolstered. They thought Han San was a person who relied solely on his super pet for strength, and that he wasn't all that proficient in battle himself. Now that they had used their Shura liquid, their power exceeded what they believed possible for a human being. Thus, they thought killing him would be a trivial task. Seeing the first weapon's approach, Han San waved him flaming Rex Spike. The Rex Spike shone with a green light, and without fear, he committed to the battle they brought towards him. The green light came from Han Sen's simulation of the Armored Phantom. He could simulate it 100%. Han Sen's life force was not as strong as the Armored Phantom's, however, so the light was a little weaker. Kacha, the indestructible green light, cleaved through every one of his foe's elemental attacks. When he reached Manager Chu's longsword, Han Sen's swing broke it with ease. Impossible. How can you unleash such power? Manager Chu and the rest of his people were all shocked. They had all used Shura liquid to increase their fitness to a level that granted them elemental powers. Hansen never used anything of the sort. With no body-boosting concoctions, they had no idea how he had managed to become so strong and do such a thing. Unleashing power is not that good. Hansen waved his flaming wreck spike towards one of his attackers. The green light spun alongside the flaming wreck spike, becoming a green light drill bit. The man it was coming for raised his giant rock of a shield, in the hopes of blocking the incoming hit. The flaming wreck spike drilled through the rocky shield like butter. Its speed was not impeded in the slightest, and it cut clean through into the man's body. The bloodhorn Shura roared, as his body began to turn into stone, but it seemed useless in opposition to the green drill bit. The rocky body was of no resistance, and after the drill pierced through, he was instantly killed. The faces of his opponents all changed. They did not expect Han San to possess such a power, even with his super pet. He was far stronger than any scrap of intel had informed them. Han San waved his flaming wreck spike and put his enemies at a disadvantage. He was still winning, despite going up against six people at the same time. His enemies went all pale. They believed their Shura liquid was enough to compete against a super pet, but now, they were brought to the startling realization that it wasn't even enough to deal with Han Sen himself. What is going on? How can Han Sen cast and unleash such power? Why is he so strong? Did he find a way to absorb life geno essences? Has he become a celestial being? Manager Chu was suddenly brought to fear. He didn't want to fight Han Sen any longer. Let's go. When we return, we must make sure to inform the boss that Han Sen has managed to absorb life geno essences. And we must tell him that he has become a celestial being, Manager Chu shouted before running off. 
Five of the fighters still remained, but they did not stay for long. They all took off running in different directions, as fast as the wind. Han Sen coldly laughed and chased after Manager Chu. Manager Chu saw Han Sen chase after him, but felt relieved. Even if Han Sen could catch up with him, the others would have gone far enough away to be safe from any other pursuit he sought to give. One way or another, the message would be delivered to their boss. But then, Manager Chu saw Han Sen summon a blonde angel and a black armored queen. I want two of them alive. Kill the rest. Han Sen coldly commanded. The angel and queen flew in different directions, and their speed truly shocked Manager Chu. That kind of speed. They must both be super pets. You have two super pets? Manager Chu's heart was shattered into pieces. He spoke to himself aloud, acknowledging his underestimation of Han San. According to the boss's calculation, they wouldn't have been able to kill him even if they had twice the men. Han Sen's own power and all the stuff he had managed to collect over time were far beyond their wildest expectations. You are wrong. I only have one super pet. The other is a king spirit. Oh, silly me. Perhaps you haven't heard? King spirits are what you refer to as super spirits. They are officially titled king class spirits. Han San moved his body and shot right behind Manager Chu, with a speed faster than any other human could achieve. King Spirit? Manager Chu exclaimed in shock, now having lost the ability to run. It's over. It's all over. We were so wrong. Han San had gauged the power possessed by Manager Chu and his followers. They were not far from the strength of a super creature, but the strength they had was not stable. It wasn't pure. When they became Bloodhorn Shura, their abilities were akin to that of a celestial being. They could unleash elemental projectiles, yes, but they were not even able to defeat Han San, whose fitness was around 260. Their purity and stability were too low, which led to their inability to compete. Another thing was their lack of experience with the powers that had been bestowed upon them. Whether it was because of a lack of practice with such strength, or the inability of the power to be wielded with finesse due to the fact that it came from medicine, Han San was unsure. It looks like I overestimated the power of this sure liquid thing. It doesn't seem to work all that well, after all. Han San threw the flaming Rex spike at Manager Chu like a boomerang, and it knocked him over. Then, Han San pointed at his head and said, Answer my questions and I'll set you free. Pa, save your breath. I won't tell you anything. Manager Chu's face changed when he spoke. His body began to inflate and expand like a balloon. Boom! Han Sin jumped away as Manager Chu's body exploded like a piñata, scattering bits and pieces of his person across the area in a sudden red haze. The giblets of Manager Chu then quickly began to rot and fade away into nothing. Han Sin's face changed, unable to believe a person could so completely disregard the importance of their own life. No one willingly wanted to die, but Manager Chu's behavior made him frown. It looks like someone might have done something to them. If not, how did that happen? Han Sin frowned and looked at where his angel and the queen had gone. A while later, they came back empty handed, which disappointed Han Senator the same thing had happened to them. They had attempted to capture the ones that fled, but they willing gave themselves up to a sudden, grisly end. Who are these people? Han Sin throve Nid. He couldn't find anything out about their identities, as they were all carrying the same gear. Obviously, someone had distributed their wares to them. Finding anything out about them seemed hopeless. But Han Sen did manage to get his mitts on a few unused vials of the Shura liquid. When he returned, he planned to have others research its content for him. Han Sen put the vials into his pack and went towards the empty vine. Roaring and sounds of impact were audible as a big fight ensued. Han Sen kept a low profile as he returned his little angel and queen. Sneakily, he ventured out towards the peak. There, he witnessed the black phoenix casting gusts composed of black fire as it flapped its wings towards the vine. But the flames did not travel far, as a green elephant raised its trunk and blew out lime-colored water to douse them. Around the peak, another eight super creatures stood guard. They prevented the approach of any and all other creatures. On the peak, a man with long, sharp ears stood tall. His eyes were red, and he was dressed in a black robe. He stood right beside the four empty fruit, 
patiently waiting for them to finish ripening. The empty fruit were purplish, and at the same time luminous. Their pleasant fragrances wafted far and wide, covering the lands in a wondrous scent for dozens of miles. Anyone who smelled it would become intoxicated. Their hearts would jump with a sudden zest and vibrancy, and they'd be a lot livelier. It looks like the empty fruit is going to become ripe any second now. Han Sen's heart was stricken with excitement. The situation was better than he feared it might be. He was worried that the Devil Blood King might only make a move and release himself once the fruit had ripened. Now, he had already conquered the top and was guarded by a slew of super creatures that followed his commands. That was what Han Sen wanted, for it benefited him the most. Seeing the empty fruit not yet ripe, Han Sen did not rush. Patiently, he watched the fight unfold. There were nine super creatures running up the slopes now, with the empty fruit as their target. Hansen had seen many of them before. The Black Flame Phoenix and Green Kirin were there. The Black Tiger, Armored Phantom, Black Skeleton, and Big White Goose were also there. The other three approached together, and he had not seen them before. From what he could see, though, they looked frightening. Aside from the Black Phoenix and the Green Kirin, both of whom attacked the Lime Green Elephant, the others fought with the rest one. As the battle raged, none triumphed over each other, however. Overall, they seemed to be locked in a stalemate. Han Sen did not know where the Devil Blood King had earned his eight super creatures, but they were all incredibly powerful, and they did not look likely to lose. Although the Armored Phantom, Black Skeleton, Black Flamed Phoenix, and Green Kirin were strong enough to restrict their opponents, it was too difficult for them to ascend and reach the peak. They most certainly wouldn't be getting it done in any short amount of time. The four empty fruit were close to maturing now, as well. It looked as if the attacking super creatures were not going to reach their destination in time. Han San continued to hide on the nearby mountainside, and then he summoned Moment Queen. Quietly, he asked her, Moment, how long left until it matures? Moment Queen looked at the empty fruit and frowned. She said, There seems to be a problem with the empty fruit. Hansen Lukid put slid. When he observed the fruit, he didn't notice anything out of place. So, he asked, what problem? Moment Queen took a second to contemplate her response, and then said, I have seen the empty fruit before, and I know that there should be only one. Although that was over a hundred years ago, in no way should there be an additional three. It would take another thousand years for something like that to occur, so I am unable to understand why it has an extra three all of a sudden. Are you saying three of those empty fruits are fake? Hansen looked surprised by this sudden revelation. I don't know, but they do seem real enough, Moment Queen answered, after spending a long time gazing at the fruit. Hee hee. Hansen was going to ask something else, but all of a sudden, he heard that strange laugh again. It unnerved him, and he looked around to find where it was coming from. Again, there was no one there. All he could see were the creatures fighting on the mountainside. Strange. What is this peculiar phenomenon? Hansen was rather spooked. He was aware now that someone had to be following him, yet he couldn't discover who it was. No, that's not right, Moment Queen said with a frown. Her eyes were locked upon the empty fruit with visible confusion. What's not right? Hansen asked. It's not just the number that is incorrect. The fruit itself is not right, either. Moment Queen said. Why? What's not right with it? Han Sen did not hurry Moment Queen for an answer. He just looked at her, as an uneasy feeling came over him. Although I have never seen a mature empty fruit, and these do seem as if they're about to mature very soon, there is something different about them, Moment Queen said, as she pointed towards the vine. Just as Moment Queen was about to elucidate the reason why, the four fruits suddenly began to shine. The pleasant smell became a fog, like the holy fruit when it first matured. Han San wasn't sure whether or not he should go to the fruit, as Devil Blood King had already reached out his hands to grab them. Maintaining his restraint, he continued to stare at the four empty fruit that the Devil Blood King sought to take. Then he asked Moment Queen, Can you explain the anomaly you have noticed with the empty fruit? What's different about them? Moment Queen said, before I entered the third god's sanctuary, I was able to catch a glimpse of raw, empty fruit. They possessed a very refreshing energy flow, but these four that I see now have a high concentration of power. 
They aren't lively and refreshing as I once saw them before. They're too powerful now. Hansen had never seen empty fruit before, so he couldn't personally validate what she was telling him. But he too could tell that the fruit was extraordinarily powerful and devoid of the sort of refreshing energy she spoke of. Hans San chose to believe what she was telling him, and so he did not make a move. He just watched the Devil Blood King grab the four fruits. It was easy and effortless for him. He picked up the first one, and it released an intoxicating scent. Its simple fragrance was enough to make you feel as if you were melting. The Devil Blood King looked extremely pleased, and he immediately consumed the fruit. After he ate it, his body emanated that same pleasant smell. Han Sin thought a creature might have resided within the fruit and was about to suddenly burst out and attack the Devil Blood King. Unfortunately, despite watching his consumption of the fruit, nothing of the sort seemed to happen. Instead, his body seemed to generate a holy aura. The effects of the fruit were indeed rather powerful. What is this? I thought you said there was a problem with the empty fruit? Han San asked, with his eyes wide fixated on the Devil Blood King who was helping himself to the second empty fruit. Moment Queen merely frowned and did not say a word. She seemed to be just as confused as Han San. Han San had waited this long already, so he decided to be patient a while longer and not do anything rash. He wanted to stay and see if any problems arose. If there are four of them, and three of them may be fake, was the Devil Blood King merely lucky enough to select the correct one for his first munch? Hansen von der Ed. But when the Devil Blood King picked the second one from the vine, nothing else seemed to happen. Everything that transpired on his first selection happened with the second. The fruit still smelled nice, as did Devil Blood King. The fruit seemed as precious as it was supposed to be. Damn it, I should have run up there sooner. Hansen's heart was feeling deep regret over his hesitation. Now, he felt like summoning his little angel and storming the mountain alongside her and Moment Queen. Perhaps there was still enough time for him to collect the other two fruits. But just as he contemplated these actions, he heard something in his ear. It was the phantom woman's voice that had been pestering him recently, except this time, it wasn't just a strange giggling. The voice actually told him something. Do not approach. Han San heard these three simple words with surprising clarity. He had already taken a step forward but now, he quickly pulled back. Who are you? Hansen looked around but could not see anyone. All he could espy were the vistas he had grown familiar with recently, and the only woman present in the vicinity was Moment Queen. Moment Queen looked at Hansen queerly, unsure of why he seemed to be scanning the surroundings. She looked around herself but made no discovery, even though she did not know what to look for. Hansen didn't hear the woman's voice again after that and he received no answer to his question. But when he looked at the empty vine now, something seemed to change. The Devil Blood King was still holding the second empty fruit. He hadn't eaten it yet, but he looked drunk. His body swayed strangely until, after a while of being off balance, he collapsed on the ground. The empty fruit in his hand rolled down the hill towards the Black Tiger. Suddenly overcome with joy, the Black Tiger spared no time in quickly gobbling it up. After he ate it, the creature tried to spread its wings and depart the area. But when it took off, its body seemed to tremble and spasm wildly until it lost its airborne composure and came crashing down to the ground. The griffin that was previously fighting the black tiger leapt on top of it and ripped its throat out with a visceral bite. Han Sen was frozen, watching the scene unfold. In his heart, he thought to himself, this empty fruit really does have a problem. Seeing the Devil Blood King and the Tiger both on the ground, unable to gather their composure and get back on their feet, Han San was suddenly relieved to learn he had made the right decision in staying put. Had he gone up there, it would have been him who was in that state. The other super creatures now realized that there might indeed be a problem with the fruit. They all backed away to watch the Devil Blood King and the Black Tiger convulse on the ground. The super creatures near the Devil Blood King, aside from the Griffin, all stopped their fighting. They merely looked upon their master with profound confusion. The griffin did not relent in its scathing of the black tiger. The black tiger was riddled with wounds and injuries in its defenseless state. As much as it may have wanted to, the black tiger could not stand up to protect itself, and it had no choice but to accept the griffin's brutality. 
When Han Sin thought the black-winged tiger was on the precipice of death, it roared and delivered a blow to the griffin that knocked it away. It was like it had just been injected with a stimulant, and its strength suddenly multiplied. The griffin cried out and hastily attacked the black tiger again. But then, the black tiger roared to the sky and gave off a terrifying presence. This shocked the griffin, and the roar stopped it in its tracks. It quickly stopped its advance and no longer approached the tiger. As it roared to the sky again, the tiger's black, metallic body suddenly became decorated with a purple pattern. The purple pattern was scribbled upon its belly, and it looked like two seedlings intertwined with each other. The strange diagram grew across its belly, and it covered the beast more and more. The pattern itself was like a vine, and it was strange and mystic to witness. It grew all the way around the tiger's back and continued until its entire body was covered. The more the purple pattern grew, the stronger the tiger's life force seemed. The other super creatures in the area were becoming extremely alarmed and unnerved by the developing situation. Han San summoned his devil eye mask and took a look at the black tiger, noticing how its life force was almost reminiscent of a volcanic eruption. The intensity of the beast's heat signature had tripled, and it showed no sign of slowing down. Does this imply the empty fruit is good or bad then? Han San wore a puzzled expression, unable to comprehend what he was seeing. Han Sin returned his gaze to the Devil Blood King. He seemed to be faring better than Black Tiger, and he seemed to have a better handle on enduring the effects. But, before long, his face too began to reveal the purple pattern. Roar! The Black Tiger's call was deafening, and it flapped its wings and flew towards the griffin. Its speed had doubled. The griffin cried out in response, and flew to engage the tiger with its talons raised. But its courage was for naught. In the same second, they made contact with each other. A wide part of its flesh was torn right from the bone. Previously, they were almost as strong as each other. But now, the tiger was dominating its foe. The griffin couldn't resist the black tiger, which far exceeded it in every department, power and speed, in particular. It wasn't long before the griffin's entire body was riddled with a variety of wounds and lesions, many of which exposed the bones inside. Seeing the vast boon of power that the Black Tiger had been granted, the other super creatures in the area suddenly became excited. Roar! Many creatures roared to the sky in unison, then they all stampeded towards the vine. Desperately, they all wanted to grab the final two fruit that remained. The mountain was quickly thrown into chaos once more. The only difference this time was that the griffin was badly injured, and the lime green elephant was struggling to compete with its two enemies. In the meantime, the Devil Blood King still lay on the ground, seemingly uninterested in trying to obtain the final two fruits the other creatures were vying for. The creatures were panicked, and pandemonium reigned as they tried to grab the fruit before the Devil Blood King could stand back up again. This is not right. It really isn't right. Han San continued to stare at the Devil Blood King and the Black Tiger, which had become far stronger since eating the empty fruit. He believed that there was something wrong, though, and as he looked on the Devil Blood King, he knew the spirit was struggling. Something wasn't right. He believed the Devil Blood King remained motionless so that he could better attempt to resist something. But if the empty fruit was supposed to benefit those that consumed it, why would he resist? The Devil Blood King continued to lie where it was, with the occasional twitch. The pattern scrawled its way across more and more of the creature's face. It seemed as if it would not be long before he forewent his current control and composure. Boom! The lime elephant could no longer withstand the combined attacks of the black flame phoenix and the green Kirin. The chain of their defensive circle broke, opening an opportunity for them all to race up towards the vine. The black flame phoenix screamed with excitement and like a sentient flame, rushed over to the empty fruit and swallowed one. The green Kirin followed it from behind, and attempted to eat the final fruit. Just as it attempted to grab it, another super creature prevented its retrieval. The black skeleton was there, and it had taken its chance to race up the peak and grab the final fruit with its bony fingers. All the other creatures stopped moving immediately. Now that the empty fruit was all gone, there was no longer any point in fighting over it. The black flame phoenix and the black skeleton immediately reacted like the black tiger had. They collapsed, 
When the other super creatures sought to leave the area, they suddenly heard screaming. The Devil Blood King stood upon two feet once more and yelled out to the high heavens. His face was scribbled all over by the strange purple pattern. Many of the terrifying creatures believed the Devil Blood King was going to become even stronger, but they were wrong. The Devil Blood King reached out a hand, and his fingers morphed into the shape of claws. The entire hand turned blood red, and it looked as if blood was going to ooze from it any second. All the creatures seemed alert, and they paid great attention to the Devil Blood King. They believed he was going to attack and mercilessly slaughter them. But what happened next put them in a state of frozen surprise. The Devil Blood King shouted as his blood-red hand tore off his own armor. When he was done, he punched his fist through his naked chest and ripped his own heart out. Everyone and everything was shocked by the spectacle they had just witnessed, unable to comprehend why the mighty Devil Blood King had suddenly chosen to tear his own heart out. Pang! The Devil Blood King clenched the hand that held his heart into a fist, squashing it into jelly as his body vanished and returned to the spirit stone he belonged to. When his body vanished, an empty fruit dropped to the ground. But it was no longer an empty fruit. It was more like a seed that had vines growing out of it. The vines were purple and red, and they looked as if they had been drenched in blood. Hansen was shocked, and he thought to himself, there really was something wrong. It was fortunate that I chose not to go. Had I been the one to grab that fruit, that would have been me. The super creatures all stared at the purple-red vine, and as they did, the vines moved. Instantly, the vines extended and shot out to grab the green Kirin which was closest to it. The green Kirin was as terrified as it was angry. Its body flashed green as it cast water arrows to strike the vines that grabbed it. But the vines had thorns growing along them and they pierced through the Kirin's green scales with apparent ease. They wormed their way through its flesh and continued to drill their way inside. Hansen felt a chill run down his spine as he watched. It was unlike anything he had ever seen before, and it was so odd it felt surreal. Even though the other super creatures were frightened by what was happening, none of them were sure how they should react. They merely watched the vines drill their way into the Kirin's body. As the vines drilled in, the green scales of the Kirin began to develop a purple pattern as well. The more that pattern overtook it, the weaker its resistance to the vine was. Roar! As the green Kirin continued to twitch in agony, they heard a roar. The black tiger was going for the griffin once more. On the other side of the peak, the black skeleton and the black flame phoenix were starting to develop a purple pattern across their bodies, too. They stood up and made scary noises and then attacked the creatures that were closest to them. It was chaos again, as the blood of super creatures began to drench the mountainside. The black skeleton and the black flame phoenix were far more powerful right now, and they savagely destroyed any super creature they fought. With a misty red haze, the peak was doused in the color red. Roar! The green Kirin stood up again, looking angry. Its body was covered in the phantom pattern by now, and it leapt over to the lime-green elephant. In between the splashes of lime, the Kirin was able to tear into its back. With its ravenous mouth, it ripped open the flesh to expose the spine inside. Blood began to cascade from the wound. The other super-creatures, which were currently free of attackers, all decided to escape the area. They all knew there was something wrong with the fruit they had previously been hungry for, and so they all thought it was best to book before something bad happened to them. The creatures that had been trapped were having difficulty committing to flight. This was especially true for the griffin, which would soon be killed by the merciless black tiger. Hansen's heart went cold. It was all too strange, and he knew that he himself should run off now while he could. You can run, but you must make him stay. The woman's voice sung in Hansen's ears once more, and it made him shiver. Who? Hansen was shocked by the sudden instruction. He looked around. But again, the voice was accompanied by no nearby person. Han Sen gritted his teeth and bid for Moment Queen to follow him. He wanted to get as far away from this strange place as he could right now. When he lifted his leg, Han Sen felt something. He dashed out of the way just as the ground cracked open and a lashing vine suddenly appeared. Amazed, Han Sen saw it was coming from the empty vine. Many more shot through the ground, all seemingly coming for him. 
F asterisk CK my luck. Hansen swore to himself. He jumped, summoned his flaming wreck spike, and swung it at the vines that came towards him. The flaming wreck spike, that he again imbued with a green light, tore through numerous vines. But it was seemingly to no avail, as more and more vines appeared. Hansen jumped and attempted to go airborne, but in the next second, he froze. Countless vines sprung out of the ground like a coven of wyverns. They twirled in between each other, forming a barrier to block his ascent. Young! Hansen's flaming rex spike whacked against a vine that was thicker than a train. He created a meter-thick dent in the vine, but it wasn't nearly enough to cut through it and give himself release. Many other vines now came towards him, and Han San could do naught but run. He cast arrow and took off flying low. He dodged many of the vines that came for him, but the chance of escape seemed slim. Han San did not dare use wings, because the wings were nowhere close to the speed of arrow, and neither were they as agile. If he used his wings, a vine was sure to grab a hold of him and pull him down. Moment Queen moved quickly alongside him. She appeared to be a whole lot more relaxed than Han San was, however. It was strange to see her so composed, given the situation. The vines that netted together continued to grow and extend across the sky, forming a cage that would eventually to keep them trapped where they were. Make him stay. Hansen heard the woman's voice once more. Make who stay? There's no need to be so ambiguous and mysterious. Just tell it to me straight. Hansen still couldn't see where the woman was talking to him from, but he still spoke aloud in response. Han San did not think what he said would yield much of anything, but after he spoke, the raging vines stopped and returned to the soil. Hansen looked around, but no one appeared. All the super creatures that had come to the mountain for the fruit had now dispersed and vanished. Only a few remained. There was the griffin, which was dead, and there were also the black flame phoenix, the green kirin, the black skeleton, and the black tiger. They stood atop the peak as if they were frozen. He was unsure what they were doing. But after taking a closer look, he was given quite a shock. The legs of the four super creatures had grown roots, and vines had replaced what was once their hair. Their eyes seemed sullen and empty as they stood there. They looked like vegetables, unable to move or even blink. Hansen used his devil eye mask to watch them. Their life forces were still strong, but ever so slowly, that energy was being driven into the roots. Needless to say, Han San was quite surprised. He thought to himself, Is this the way the empty vine produces its offspring? All these creatures are made to become some sort of parasite host, is that it? And they provide the nutrients for the newborn vines? Han San thought it was a terrifying thing to witness, and that the vines were scarier than any other creature he had encountered before. Fortunately for him, he had decided not to eat the empty fruit. Becoming fertilizer was not in his best interests. If such powerful creatures were unable to resist the parasite-like being, Han Sen's human body would never have stood a chance. What is the current situation, then? The four empty fruit have already found their hosts, so why does it want me here? What does she want? Han San now believed the woman's voice was in fact the empty vine, since the voice seemed to control it. Han San, however, couldn't comprehend what the vine might have wanted from him. And neither did he know who the person she wished for him to make stay was. The strange woman's voice no longer spoke to him, though. As he scanned the area in confusion, the empty vine that poked through the peak of the mountain began to stretch open as if blossoming. A new vine stretched out from the center, and there, Han San saw a fist-sized green fruit. It was glowing beneath the sunlight with a lime glare. Han Sen's nose smelled something nice, and it made his body feel at ease. In his heart, he thought to himself, Moment Queen was right after all. The four fruits from earlier were not the genuine empty fruit. This one right here has to be the real one. Han Sen, however, did not dare to approach. He merely watched the crystal clear fruit that hung on the vine from afar. He could see where its core was, and there was a baby like thing inside, similar to a fetus. The baby was too small, and it was all curled up, obscuring its gender. While Hansen looked at it, this single vine approached him. The fruit hung from the vine less than ten feet away from him. The baby that was curled up inside the core had its eyes closed, yet Hansen felt as if he was being checked out by it. 
he felt as if he was being watched. Make him stay and you can go. Not long after, Han Sen heard the female voice once more. Are you talking to me? Han Sen looked at the baby inside the fruit with much shock and posed the question to it. Who else? The female voice spoke. As the empty fruit trembled upon the vine it grew upon, it was telling him that it was indeed her that was talking. Are you the super creature created by the empty vine? When Han Sen said this, he suddenly felt rather stupid. The answer to that question was fairly obvious. Sort of yes, but sort of no, too. The baby's answer surprised Han Sen. What is that supposed to mean? Han Sen asked with curiosity, while a portion of his mind thought of a way he could escape the area. He had a lot of treasure on him, but he didn't want to give it to anyone. No matter what the baby wanted, he wouldn't give away anything of his. With little silver, the little angel and moment queen, and the unreliable fairy, I should be able to flee from here. Han San then looked at the four super creatures that were starting to look like plants, and suddenly lost the confidence he had just given himself. I am me, I that swallowed the seed of the holy empty. I was reborn. My genes advanced and took me to the third god's sanctuary, but now, I do not know if I am truly myself. The female voice sounded heavy and solemn. Han Sen's heart leapt at the words, and he asked, Are you the same as these super creatures? Han Sen was referring to the Black Flame Phoenix, and the rest that were under the influence of the parasitic force. The fruit moved, and then the female voice spoke again. After thousands of years, the empty vine bears fruit. They are reborn, and their genes have improved. But who knows if they are still themselves right now? Han Sen thought to himself, the emotions of this empty fruit don't seem too stable. If I play my cards right, maybe I can escape. Thinking this, he told the empty fruit, If you feel this way, why do you force others to swallow the holy seeds? The woman responded, If I am born, I can open the gate to the third god's sanctuary. And then, I will leave the second god's sanctuary and the empty vine will die. If I do not leave behind seeds, there would not be any holy vines. I am me, and I am also the holy vine. Even though I exist here, it is difficult for me to control my natural function of producing offspring. Han Sen did not know what to say. Right now, she wasn't completely herself. She was once a super creature but now, half of her body was composed of the empty vine's genes. It was a super creature that was created through the union of animals and plants. It was difficult to imagine it being in the alliance. What were you before? Hansen couldn't help but ask, as a super creature such as this was sure to have some history. I was an empty spirit witch. I am still an empty spirit witch. The voice spoke with assuredness, and it went on to say, I have already answered your questions. Can you give him over to me now? I have to be honest with you. I really don't know what it is that you want. If you told it to me straight, I could have given it to you much earlier, Hansen tested. I want your plant of a holy spirit. There is nothing else you can provide that I see value in, the empty spirit which said, Plant of a Holy Spirit? Han Sen's heart jumped, and he presented her his gourd. Then he asked, Is this it? Is this what you want? Yes, empty spirit which confirmed. And then, the vine moved to take the gourd from Han Sen. Hang on. Han Sen pulled back his hand and then said, At least tell me why you want it. The empty spirit which seemed upset by the question that was posed and said, for some reason, it did not grow as it should have. I am going to help it grow again, this time to its fullest. Hansen froze, not expecting her to feel this way about it. When he first received the gourd, the gourd and the vines it clung to were dry and had almost died. What she said sort of made sense, and it didn't seem as if she was lying. Are you saying the gourd is like you? There is a super creature inside? Han Sin recalled the giant, vine-wreathed bones that lay near the gourd. If the gourd created a giant creature similar to that, things would surely prove interesting. She denied Han Sin's thinking and said, It's different. It is a pure plant of a holy spirit. It is special and it cannot be compared with me. Where is it from? Han Sin asked. He wasn't willing to give up the gourd, as it was something he played with almost every day. He had grown quite attached to Enigma. And if it was truly a holy spirit that was still growing, it wasn't something he'd be quite willing to just hand over. 
Han Sin had always been a greedy person, and unless death was certain, he wouldn't hand over his treasure. I don't know, but I can sense its holy presence. I cannot tell where it is from, the empty spirit which said. If it is not the same as you, then why do you want it? Hansen asked, looking at empty witch spirit. She seemed to be annoyed by the barrage of questions and no longer answered him. Instead, she said, that is none of your business, just give it to me. After that, the vine came again at Hansen's hand. In response, he took two steps back and evaded it. This infuriated the empty spirit witch, and now her vines came out of the ground like dragons. They netted the sky once more, attempting to deny Han Sin any chance of escape. Didn't you say you would enter the third god's sanctuary once you were born? How can you help this grow? It is not something you can do in a single day. Han Sin shouted and readied himself to summon the little angel. If he couldn't talk his way out of this, then fighting his way out was the only option. He wasn't willing to hand over the gourd. If Han San was willing to put up a fight and beat her, then there'd be no stopping him. Furthermore, if he did destroy the super creature, he'd be defeating one that was on the precipice of entering the third god's sanctuary. But Han San was afraid of the four other super creatures that were nearby. The holy seeds were growing inside them, and although they were rooted down on the peak, there was no telling whether or not they could join the fight. Even so, Han San steeled himself for battle. But when the empty spirit which heard what he said, she quelled her aggression and said, what you say makes sense. I will be born soon, and it will be difficult for me to stay here. I can't take care of it. Hansen quickly replied by saying, Then how about you let me take care of it? I have already been taking good care of it. In fact, I treat this gourd as well as I would my own son. I keep it fed, and it has even had the opportunity to drink up countless gallons of super creature blood. Hansen painted himself in the most positive light possible as if he wanted to adopt a poor child into a wealthy family. She seemed touched by his words, and then, the baby inside the fruit opened its eyes. Emerald eyes peered right at him. She looked at Han San and the silver fox that rested on his shoulder, and then looked at the fairy inside his pocket. After a while of examining his person, she said, Okay, you will take care of him, but he will be born with an incomplete gene. It will be difficult for this thing to be born regardless of how much super creature blood it drinks. Wait here. When I am born, I will provide it with empty spirit blood. By doing that, I will repair its flaws. Hansen happily agreed. He would receive a gift without having to risk his life. Seeing the fruit outside the empty spirit which, he then thought of something. When the holy rhino entered the third god's sanctuary, it shed all of its old flesh. Now that she was going to the third god's sanctuary, Hansen wondered if that meant she'd also have to leave the fruit of her composition behind. If she did, it might be just as good as the flesh of that rhino. Hansen then waited for the empty spirit which to be born, so he could take the fruit. Even if he couldn't eat it, it might prove beneficial to his new spirit owl. The vine with the fruit returned to the hill, and as it went, it released a refreshing fragrance. As time passed, Hansen was able to observe the baby growing inside the core. It wasn't a shocking, violent scene as it had been with the holy rhino. The entire spectacle was mellow and serene. It remained there quietly, awaiting its own birth. Perhaps she had evolved slowly over the course of a thousand years, and it wasn't a sudden transformation as it had been with the rhino. Everything was natural, and Han San waited there for two days. On the morning of the third day, the core of the fruit cracked. Like an actual baby, the empty spirit which waddled out of the fruit. She was almost the same size as the fairy, but lacked wings. She was naked, and a purple marking adorned her forehead. Aside from that, there was nothing special about her person. The empty spirit which came closer and arrived before Han Senator, she was surrounded by spots of light, which floated upwards into the sky. Bring out the holy spirit, the empty spirit which said, standing two feet away from Han San. He was alert but he still opened his hands to reveal the gourd to her. He stared at her intently. If she tried to steal it, he'd pull it back and fight. She landed on Han Sin's hand and cut her finger. A drop of transparent blood fell onto the gourd. The blood was clearer than water, and when it dripped onto the gourd, the gourd absorbed it in a second. 
After absorbing the blood, the dry and yellow gourd showed movement. The gourd began to tremble as if with life. It didn't seem as if there was a big change, but Han Sen could sense the movement of its life force unlike ever before. Han Sen's heart was tremendously glad. He had believed she was going to do something ill-conceived, and right now, she was actually aiding him in his care of the gourd. Han Sen used to feel that the gourd lacked a certain something, and the energy flow grew a bit too slowly. But now, he had learnt that it was born damaged, which was why it was slow. Now, with the empty spirit witch's blood, the life force inside was like a freshly grown plant. It seemed to show a hunger it never had before. An unquenchable thirst for magic blood. The golden lines that decorated the gourd appeared in greater number. They had appeared before, but they had lacked the vibrancy and spark of life that were being visibly displayed right now. It indeed looked like something that had just been freshly picked from the vine. The empty spirit which looked at the gourd in a way that suggested she was waiting for something. But he did not know what. Hansen acknowledged she was hiding something, and that there was an ulterior motive for helping him. There was a reason she initially wanted the gourd for herself, but it was something Hansen had yet to discover. Boom! The air vibrated and an old wooden double door appeared in the sky. Through the frame of the door, a scary presence emerged, and as if it had influenced the atmosphere itself, the sky changed color. The spores of light that floated around the empty spirit which now started floating up directly towards the door and then, from behind those doors, a human-shaped shadow approached. Han San was able to see it, despite the fog and blurriness that masked the entrance. Beneath the gravity of the tremendous force that came, Han Sien could not remain standing for long. He fell to the ground. This had already happened to him once before, so he knew there was no use trying to resist it. Even super creatures could not withstand the pressure that came from beyond those doors. And Han Sien was only just a human, and one that wasn't a celestial being either. Put the Holy Spirit away. The empty spirit witch's eyes looked strange as she spoke to him. Her lips did not move, but he heard her clearly in his ears. Although Han San did not know what she was planning, he immediately returned the gourd to his pack. When he raised his head, she was already flying towards the old wooden doors. Boom! The door opened, and an elf-like lady appeared from the beyond. She exuded an elegance no human woman could, and yet the way she appeared seemed so natural and casual. Looking upon that woman once would imprint within your mind a sight that you could never forget. She was so natural that she blended in with the environment. No other woman looked like this. The woman stepped out from the door and looked at that empty spirit which, that was flying towards her spryly. She smiled and asked, Will you follow me along the path of evolution? Yes. The empty spirit which calmly replied, as she flew towards the woman. The woman smiled in response. She put out her hand and allowed the empty spirit which to land on it. But just as she turned around and was about re-enter the door, she looked down and stopped. She turned back around and looked at Han Sen, the empty spirit which saw her look at Han Sen, and it made her heart jump with a sudden worry. The woman observed Han Sen lying down on the ground, and she looked surprised. Then, she gazed directly at the red on Han Sen's forehead. Saint Fan was here before? This is interesting. If I encounter him, I will not be able to let him go. The woman seemed to be speaking to herself. Han San was still being pushed down to the ground, and he was unable to hear what she said. The empty spirit which did hear, however, and this seemed to bring her relief. She also turned to give Han San another look, one of much surprise. She thought the woman had noticed the gourd Han San possessed, but was surprised to see the woman was actually taking notice of the man himself. The empty spirit which would never have considered Han San, who was not even a celestial being, to be worthy of the woman's notice. Han San felt bad getting crushed into the earth, but soon after, the pressure was removed. The force felt lighter, and he was freed. Then, he stood up. He thought the woman had already taken the empty spirit which back through the door, but upon raising his head, he was surprised to still see her there, hovering in the sky. The beautiful eyes peered at him, and she smiled warmly. From now on, you belong to me. Amidst Han Sen's confusion, he had no idea why she continued to stare at him. He too thought she had discovered the presence of his gourd,
But then the woman pointed a finger directly at him. Boom! A light cracked the air and struck Han Sen's forehead. When Han Sen's mind returned, the woman was gone. She had already taken the empty spirit which backed through the wooden doors. While the empty spirit which was in the process of leaving, she looked back at Han Sen's pack as if she really missed the gourd. The old wooden doors shut, then disappeared from the sky. Hansen had a long sigh. When he touched his forehead, he felt nothing. Taking a peek at himself in his mirror, he noticed that the rouge from earlier had vanished. It had been replaced with what appeared to be the symbol of a lotus, although you'd have to pay close attention to determine what it was. On a passing glance, you would merely assume it to be a dot or pimple. These assholes, do they have nothing better to do than going around leaving stamps on people? Hansen shouted angrily. But in the next second, that anger was calmed by the sight of the fruit. When he quickly ran towards it, he found that it was ripe and had been cracked open. Although the core was gone, there was still plenty of pulp for him to gorge on. Before Han San flew up to the vine to retrieve the fruit, the empty vine began to wither. It was dying before his eyes, and as it did, its leaves turned yellow. Boom! The empty island began to quake, and it soon started to fall apart. With greater haste, Hansen soared to the peak and snatched the broken empty fruit. Then, he took off away from the island for a safer region of the skies. The giant empty vine started to crumble down to the world below, and the island went with it. Great mountains of stone caved in on themselves, falling to the lands underneath and crushing the vines that once held them aloft. The noise of such natural destruction was deafening. The area soon looked apocalyptic, as if a pillar that once held the world up had now buckled under the weight of the life above. It had broken, and the world was falling into an abyss of ruined earth and craggy rocks. The giant vine fell, and the island went with it. It was like the world was screaming, and with the flight of harmony and composure, only chaos would remain to take its place. Han Sen soared through the air, watching it all unfold from above. In the lands below, a black crater with no apparent bottom was formed. Clouds of dust materialized, shrouding the shattered peaks that skirted the mountainous region it had collapsed onto. Those mountains buckled and collapsed under the weight of the lands that fell on top of them, as well. And it disfigured the coarse highlands into a ruinous hellscape. Hansen waited until all had settled before returning to the lands below. He flew down to observe the place where the island had come down. It was broken, and its hewn mountains had all but crumbled and disappeared, but evidence of its past still remained. Strangely, however, the mountain peak where the four fruit were born was wholly intact. The four super creatures were there, as well, standing like sculpted fauna. The seedlings on their heads already seemed to be growing healthily. Their roots must have coursed deep into the peak, although Han San couldn't guess how far they went. Han San took in the sight for a while longer and eventually decided to leave. He was wondering if he'd receive something by cutting the seedlings, but if he did that, the vines would become extinct. And Han San was concerned about the likelihood of the vine attempting to protect itself from would be ruiners, and so he gave up his idea of giving them a shave. Han San had already received plenty of rewards from this outing. His gourd had been fixed, and he had received the empty fruit. There was no need for him to cut the seedlings. Han San tried to nibble a bit of the empty fruit for himself, but it was like sand. It was impossible for him to consume such a thing. But he knew it was quite similar to the holy rhino's meat, which was harmful when he attempted to eat it as well. The fairy tried to rush out of the shell to greedily consume the fruit, but Han San was quick enough to stop her and push her back inside. When Han San had needed help in the dire situations that had arisen on this outing, she hadn't helped once. Han San was not at all willing to give her a share of the spoils. The silver fox started to show some movement, and it clearly wanted some of the empty fruit, too. He stroked it to comfort it, but summoned his death knell and brought out his gourd to see if they wanted it first. They showed no reaction, so Han San cut the fruit into five separate portions. He gave one piece to the silver fox one piece to the fairy, and one to the owl. The last two pieces were given to Moment Queen. Moment Queen had proven herself invaluable and had helped out a lot throughout this excursion. Therefore, he wasn't willing to go cheap on the reward he wished to give her. Moment Queen accepted the two pieces, and after that, 
The way she looked at Han San was somewhat different. She believed Han San would only be willing to give her one slice at the most. She was very surprised to receive two. If you serve me well, I won't mistreat you. You earn this, Han San told Moment Queen. Moment Queen nodded in response and then ate the two pieces of fruit. Nothing changed, and so Han San returned her to the Sea of Soul. Where is little uncle? Surely he did not get buried beneath the carnage of the island that collapsed, did he? Han San was slightly worried by Wang Yuhang's disappearance and went to look for him. As Han San was thinking about where he might dig and search for the fellow, he espied him in the distance. He was waving. Han San sighed and went over to meet with him. He gave him directions to a safer place and then returned to Moment Shelter. When Han San returned to Moment Shelter, he was greeted with the sound of battle. The noises of a fight clashed against the roaring of Little Black and Big Black. Who dares enter my territory uninvited? Han San ran inside and saw the armored phantom fighting the two. Big Black was unable to beat the armored phantom, and Little Black was still recovering from its injuries. And now, they were both bleeding heavily from wounds sustained in the fight. The armored phantom had seen Han San about to be trapped by the vine back on the island, so it believed him to have been killed. Therefore, it had returned here to take the shelter. It wasn't expecting his sudden return, and as soon as Han San appeared, it attempted to flee. You come here, bully my guard dogs and now try to run? I don't think so. Go get him. Han San summoned Moment Queen and the little angel to attack the intruder. The armored phantom was quite powerful, and it lasted a whole hour against them before Moment Queen was able to finish it off. Moment Queen killed the super creature Steel Knight King. The beast soul has been gained. The flesh of this creature is inedible, but you may harvest its life geno essence. Consume its life geno essence to gain zero to ten super geno points randomly. You may retrieve the beast soul from Moment Queen. Take it now. Without a second of hesitation, Han Sin immediately took the beast soul. One thing about this latest kill stood out to Han San in particular. The Steel Knight King was a second generation creature and the announcement said he was unable to consume its flesh. If a first-generation super creature could not be eaten, its body would decompose. Strangely, however, this body remained. The green light vanished, but the armor and greatsword did not disappear. Is this its gear? Han Sen picked up the armor and steel greatsword. They were quite heavy, but after giving it a few swings, Han Sen thought the sword felt good to wield. Han Sen tried to simulate the energy flow of the armored phantom, and when he did, the steel greatsword emitted a beam of green light that was a few meters long. The light was much stronger than when he used it on his flaming wreck spike. It seemed to be exclusive gear, and it delighted Han Sen to receive even more good spoils from his recent escapades. Han Sen commanded the others to transfer the armor and the steel greatsword. After this was done, Han Sin went to refine the life geno essence in the spirit hall. The green life geno essence effortlessly dissolved into his body, and as it did, he felt his muscles tighten and his joints strengthen. Steel Knight King life geno essence has been absorbed. You have received one super geno point. The announcement rang multiple times in his head, and it brought Han San much joy every time. He was feeling disappointed at his recent inability to obtain super geno points and he was delightfully surprised to see the Steel Knight King practically deliver itself to him. In total, Han San received eight Super Geno points from the Life Geno Essence of the Steel Knight King. This brought his total tally up to 63. I'll be maxing out soon for sure. Han Sen's heart was as merry as one could be. After packing up, he used the teleporter at Moment Shelter to return to the Alliance. Back in the Alliance, Han Sen quickly got Ji Yin Ran on the horn. He told her about his encounter with the Bloodhorn Shura. Something like this actually happened? I must certainly inform my father about this. Ji Yinran's face looked deathly serious upon hearing what he had to say. If medicine could quickly increase the fitness of humans and allow evolvers to cast elemental powers on a whim, such a concoction would be quite terrifying. I am going to give the sample of the Shura liquid to you, Han Sen said. Okay, sure. Come and meet me. I've been meaning to see you anyway. Yianran nodded. You're in need of me? Why, what is it? Hansen wondered why she might have been in search of him. I'll tell you in person. 
Ji and Ran did not answer. Hansen agreed despite his curiosity, and he then made his way to Ji and Ran's office. If this formula can increase the power of an evolver by that much, it is quite difficult to fathom the changes it could bring. It would be a huge boon to humanity. When Ji Yin Ran accepted the vial of the Shura substance, she could still hardly believe what Han Xian had told her. Research it first. Han San knew what he had stumbled into was something of importance, but making statements about it was pointless until they learned more. If they could reverse engineer the serum and discover what it was composed of, then they could fantasize about it. But if they were unable to recreate it, and its association with the Zhao family became public, Han San believed their influence and prosperity would become unstoppable. Anyway, why were you looking for me? Han Sen asked Yi Yan Ram. A group of Shura will be visiting the Alliance soon, and I will be attending the feast that we are to share with them. I was hoping you could join me, Ji Yin Ran said, as she put away the sample. A group of Shura? What are they doing here? Hansen asked, with much surprise. They are here to discuss a possible truce, Ji Yin Ran said with a smile. A truce? Hansen looked hooked. Humanity and the Shura had been locked in conflict for many years now. The fighting had mostly stopped, but there hadn't been any official declaration of peace. Ji and Ran smiled and said, Humans have developed too quickly, and our technology has far exceeded the Shuras. Before, humanity and our bodies were much weaker than the Shura. But due to the existence of the sanctuaries, our bodies have been able to evolve. Right now, powerful humans can rival Shura. With everything else we've achieved, we have managed to get ahead and stay ahead of them. Furthermore, the king of the Shura recently died. Many nobles are currently competing for the throne, placing their entire government in turmoil. They cannot spare the time to fight with us while they attend to their own problems. Therefore, it makes sense for them to desire peace. Maybe in a few hundred years, as we develop and our technology continues to advance, we can wipe the Shura out. I suppose you are right, but I don't think that's possible. When Han San went to school, he was taught about how cruel and powerful the Shura were. He didn't expect humanity to exceed the capabilities of the Shura. It is possible. Humans are the best in the universe when it comes to learning and adapting. The Shura are too stubborn and closed-minded. What is happening now is to be expected. Ji Yinren spoke as if she was proud to be a human. Hansen smiled and said, Okay, but making peace is a huge deal. It is an issue of diplomacy. So why do you want me there? I am not asking you to be there to discuss the peace. I just want you there to mix and get to know the Shura, have fun, dance, and party with them. Ji Yinran laughed and squeezed Han Sen's face. Then, she continued to say, My father would never be stupid enough to leave the actual peace brokering to someone as inexperienced as you. No offense. Ah, you want me there just to join in the festivities? You can rely on me to be there, eating and drinking. I'm quite experienced in that. I'll have you know, Hansen said. Ji Yin Ran rolled her eyes and then looked at him. She said, You think I chose you just so you could eat? If this was about eating, I know a few others I could send their way. My dear wife, I must ask you again then. For what purpose do you want me there? Hansen grabbed Ji Yin Ran's waist and pulled her onto his lap. As he did this, his hands began to surf along her body and into her clothes. Ji Yinren blushed and said, Hey, I'm talking about something serious here. Okay, then tell me. Han San was clearly not taking things seriously, and his focus on other things was beginning to drain her of interest in the topic as well. Her face was becoming more and more red. Ji Yinren grabbed the hand that was feeling her up and said in a begging voice, Can we quickly finish this serious subject first? Okay. Han San smiled and stopped his hedonistic hand. Shura are a very proud people. Humanity has yet to determine the fate and trajectory of our race. Therefore, they cannot give up their pride. Although they have come here to make peace, they will most likely not be able to refrain from finding something to insult us over. Ji Yinran took a breath and then continued to say, Shura always poke fun and laugh at the human body. There will be many young nobles among the Shura entourage. They will find any excuse they can to challenge the combat abilities of our young. And although we have powerful people, few are capable of competing at such young ages. If we sent elderly to fight for us, even if we won, they'd still laugh at us. 
So, before Ji Yin Ran finished her speech, Hansen had realized what she was asking. There was no other human that was as powerful as him at his age. That's it. Hansen smiled and looked at her. Yeah, Ji Yin Ran answered. Then let's get down to my business. Hansen picked up Ji Yin Ran and tossed her onto the couch. Ji Yin Ran told Ji Ruajin about the Shura liquid, and he took it for the serious, concerning matter that it was. Ji Ruajin asked Han San to tell him about the liquid again, then retrieved the sample on the very same day. The Ji family was taking the entire affair more seriously than Han San believed they would. He hoped they could successfully research it, because if they could not, the Zhao family's capabilities would shock the entire alliance. Because Han San was getting ready to join the Shura Ball, he didn't have time to return to the sanctuary. Ji Yin Ran began to describe the members of the group of Shura that were coming, presenting him with pictures so he knew exactly who each one was. There are two royal families of Shura coming. One of the royal family members is a fourth-rank Shura fighter, and he is the one spearheading the entire collective that will be visiting. He isn't a person to easily lose his temper, but even if he does, others will be the ones to take care of it. It's not up to us to sort that out. After that, Ji Yin Ran showed him a different picture. It was a picture of a young, handsome Shura. He had a purple horn and long purple hair. He looked both noble and mystic. It was difficult to find humans that could compare with him. The society of the Shura was built on authority. It had existed far longer than humanity had. The royal monarchy had been established over many generations and was something no human family could ever come close to resembling. When humanity first began its interstellar era, the Shura provided them with aid because of their similar appearance. Back then, the Shura considered humanity to be inferior. Humans were not as technologically advanced or as attractive in their eyes. But they never expected that humanity would grow and achieve so much so quickly, or one day become their greatest enemy and threat. And now, humans were ahead of the Shura. The race of the Shura was now in political turmoil because of their inability to assert a new king for the throne and had to broker a peace. But the Shura had always been arrogant, and they had never really respected humanity. Despite their advancement, the Shura still considered humans to be an inferior species. The royal Shura had always been a higher class, and every person in their society had to adore them. Human society did not work like that and it was just another reason for the royals to despise their enemies. This royal Shura is called Yukailand. He is 22 years old and is a very notorious member of the Yu family. Our intel states that when the Shura reach adulthood, their fitness level is gauged to be at around 200. If they continue to train and learn their Shura skills, they can become even stronger. Yu Chelan's fitness is estimated to be at around 260. That's not a precise number, but it's an educated approximation from our best information. Ji Yin Ran introduced the man. He sounds rather powerful, but there should be many human surpassers that are around 20 years old. Wouldn't it be easier for you to just call upon a surpasser? Hansen asked, with visible confusion. Humans were able to enter the first god's sanctuary when they reached the age of 16. If they were lucky, they'd end up in a grand, populated shelter which offered much help from the larger factions. This saved people much time in collecting enough geno points to reach the second god's sanctuary. The same thing applied in the second god's sanctuary to becoming a surpasser. Although this did not happen very often, there were many people entering at all times, so a good number did end up being this fortuitous. Well, yes, there are indeed plenty of fortunate young people that are surpassers, and although we are able to call upon them, the royal Shura might not want to interact with them. Ji Yinran gave a wry smile. Why? Aren't they just as young? Han Sen asked with surprise. Their identities would be different. Ji Yinran then went on to explain. In the eyes of the Shura, humanity is considered a knockoff of their own kind. They wouldn't say that in front of us, but deep down they disdain us. If Yu Chelan wishes to fight, then he would most certainly call upon someone famous. If he wants someone to fight, he would most likely pick me. Why? Hansen was becoming even more confused. Ji Yin Ran was not very popular in the alliance at all. She may have been the daughter of the president, but she wasn't much of a fighter. With the way normal human logic worked in the alliance, no one would challenge her. Ji Yin Ran laughed and said, The Shura think differently. To them, our president is the king. As the daughter, 
that would make me the princess. He is a royal shura, and he would end up being forced to pick me for a duel as the only half-viable candidate. The shura know much about our society. If they challenge me, it is not because they don't know that I cannot fight. They would wish to humiliate us. Ji Yanran took a deep breath and then continued. My father asked that you come for insurance. If he asks me to fight, then I would need you to be my champion. You are my fiancé, after all. Shouldn't I be called a prince? The husband of a princess is called prince, if I recall, Han Sen said with a smile. He was very interested in the Shura because he wished to know whether Zero was a human or a Shura. It was one of his biggest unsolved mysteries at this point. When he found Zero, he also found a vial of an unknown substance. Han Sen did not dare show it to anyone, as he wasn't sure what it did. Not wanting to bring him or her any trouble, he placed it in his bank for security. Han San guessed that the liquid was most likely related to Zero, but he did not trust any research organization enough to turn it over for examination and testing. Therefore, Han San was keen to meet real Shura and see if he could notice a difference between them and Zero if they entered a Shura mode. He thought he might learn something. Han San had no problem fighting a royal Shura, as it was a glorious thing for him to be allowed to do. After all, Humanity and the Shura had fought each other in this galaxy for many years, and countless victims had fallen victim to their hands. Influenced by their education and environment, it was natural for humans to consider Shura as their greatest enemy. Any triumph over them would be most glorious. Han San was not allowed to take part in the meetings between the Alliance and the visiting Shura, in which they sought to broker peace. The introductory meetings took them only two days but it would take at least two months to negotiate terms. There were many conspiracies in the works, ones which Han San could not understand due to his lack of proficiency in the field of politics. All he did was wait until Ji Yin Ran was ready for him to go to the dinner. Ji Yin Ran was very nervous. After all, she was a girl. She knew Han San was strong, but the thought of him having to fight for her in such an important battle made her anxious. Such a fight wasn't meant to be life-threatening. The fight did not allow the use of weapons, and elites would be watching the entire proceedings. If things were being taken too far, demigod elites would swoop in and bring an end to the exhibit. But even so, Ji and Ran was worried. She looked for her father, wanting to know if there was a way they could avoid the fight. Ji Ruajin was fond of Han San, and he thought highly of him. He told Ji and Ran, Do not worry for his well being. He is from the Luo family. He won't lose not even in a fight against a royal shura. Unbeknownst to Ji Ruajin, however, Han Sen had refused to learn anything from the Luo family. Had he known this, his certainty in Han Sen's victory would not have been as firm. Despite her intense worry, Ji Yinran did not display it to anyone. She was particularly adamant about not letting Han Sen know how she felt, in case it affected his judgment and performance. Furthermore, she did not want to appear weak and distraught before the Shura. Hansen met Yu Chelon during the feast, and he was surprised that the Shura looked far more handsome in person than he did in the photo. Humans lacked the ability to maintain the sort of presence that the Shura displayed. But the same was true the other way around. Shura could not mimic the sensibilities of humans. Hansen preferred humans due to their greater kindness, diversity, and ability to be casual. The royal Shura might have looked handsome and enticing, but he knew he'd have difficulty getting along with them once they were beyond the formalities of the peace brokering meetings. In the middle of the feast, the Shura suggested a duel. The alliance had already prepared for this suggestion, and so everyone walked outside towards the plaza. Before the entrees had even arrived, Yu Chelon was already there waiting. Ji Yin Ran was nervous. She hoped Yu Chelon did not challenge her, for if he did, Han San would have to fight. All the humans waited with bated breath for Yu Chelon to name the person he wanted to challenge. If he chose Ji Yin Ran, although it would not be fair, she would have no choice but to accept the request. Then, as her fiancé, Han San would step forward to fight on her behalf as her champion. But there was a problem. If Han San lost, and Yu Chelon challenged Ji Yin Ran again, humans would have lost two matches. Such a thing would be a profound embarrassment. Yu Chelon's eyes were like jewels, and with them, he scanned all the young humans that were lined up before him. When his eyes fell on Ji Yin Ran, they stopped. His steady gaze made the hearts of everyone jump in their chests. 
Yu Qianlong raised his lips in a disdainful smile. Then, he looked away from her. Yu Qianlong looked at all the people before him and said, I wonder, which one of you is Dollar? I have heard he is the strongest young human by a cosmic mile. I want to fight him. When he said this, everyone froze. No one had anticipated this request. The receptionist ran up and said, Mr. Yu, I do not know where you have heard about Dollar, but what you say is not true. Huang Xiao is our most famous young one. H.M., that is strange. Then how did I hear about this Dollar person managing to achieve a position amongst the Ten Son of Gods? As for this Huang Xiao, I have never heard of him. Yu Qianlong grinned. Huang Xiao was very calm. Without any feelings of awkwardness, he said, Dollar is powerful, but I can provide the challenge you seek. Yu Qianlong looked at Huang Xiao and laughed. He said, Okay, then I'll beat you first. After that, I will go against Dollar. But you better find him for me. You better win against me first, Huang Xiao said, bravely. Yu Qianlong said nothing in response to this. He merely walked across the plaza with a happy look on his face, and the receptionist confirmed the fight. Huang Xiao had already achieved the status of a surpasser. Although he had only just reached the third god sanctuary, his fitness was over 300, and he was a powerful person, one who should have no trouble beating the young Shura royal. The fact that Yu Qianlong had not selected Ji Yanran made many people breathe a sigh of relief. Although Han San was not a bad fighter, many people still believed he relied completely on his super pet. They wouldn't feel confident about him fighting against Yu Qianlong, mano a mano. Ji Yanran was also relieved. She was not afraid of him losing, but she just didn't want him to shoulder the risk and burden of such a prestigious fight. Hansen smiled, held Ji Yin Ran from behind, and said, It looks like this young Shura noble is, well, noble. He doesn't appear to be obscene and cheap. It's a shame Dollar is not here. If he was here, I am sure he'd teach him a thing or two about combat. Yi Yan Ran smiled. So, are you saying Dollar could beat him but not me? Hansen looked jealous when he said this, and he noticed it himself. He thought it was weird for him to be jealous of his own alias. You are the best, but it is better if you remain uninjured. I fret for your safety every time you venture back into the sanctuary, Ji Yin Ran whispered into Hansen's ears. Hansen felt ashamed when he heard this. He realized he had spent too much time focused on making himself stronger, and not enough time with Ji Yin Ran. Ji Yin Ran had been busy a lot, yes, but lately, Hansen had been far busier than she had been. Huang Xiao and Yu Qianlong both entered the established battleground at the center of the plaza. An old royal shura and a demigod stood at each end of the court. If something cruel seemed set to occur, they would step in and put an end to the battle. You strike first. If I strike first, I'm afraid this will be over before it begins. Yu Qianlong looked at his opponent coldly. Okay then. Huang Xiao looked a little angry at how condescending and rude his foe was being. Although the feast and accompanying battle was not open to the media, many high-class members of the alliance had ways of watching the entire event. Normally, people wouldn't watch a fight such as this. But the people in this fight were special, so everyone of importance was sure to keep an eye on the coming duel. For a long time, the fitness of humans had been nowhere near the heights of the Shura, but humans strive to be better. Generations after their first meeting, the gap in talent between the two species was still unbridged. But then came the discovery of the sanctuaries, and after this, humanity accelerated in strength as if they were cheating. While it did not change the average human, human elites were capable of becoming stronger than the Shura. Kids and teenagers were still particularly vulnerable, being far weaker than the Shura. Humanity had many goals and the humans of this universe wanted to develop their kids and teenagers until they were naturally superior to those of the Shura. It was a common desire, shared by not only the average, working citizen but by the high-ranking officers of the Alliance, as well, the latter of which were actively working towards it. Humans below the age of 16 were unable to compete with the Shura. At around the age of 20, people who were fortunate enough could develop the necessary strength to battle them. The Shura that humans most sought to beat were the Royal Shura. They were the cream of the crop, and felling an average Shura fighter paled in comparison to the strength required to take down a Royal Shura. The Alliance had high hopes for Huang Xiao. In combat, talent, and luck, he was the best in his age bracket. 
He was born a noble, but possessed a natural talent. He was very fortunate, also. He spawned in the grandest human shelters in the first, second, and third god sanctuaries. Through this luck, he was able to grow up both safely and swiftly. All of this crafted him into who he had become on this day, and he had been personally picked by the Alliance as the one to beat the royal Shura Yu Chielon. Many people from the Alliance believed Huang Xiao had what it took to win this fight, and if he succeeded, it would bring great joy to them. The only negative was that Huang Xiao was one year older than his opponent. Still, it was an acceptable difference. Huang Xiao was not only lucky, however. He was smart, wise, and composed. Even in the midst of the pressure such a situation could pose, he remained absolutely calm. And even with the added provocation of his foe, he did not display a glimmer of anger. Hansen waited for the match to begin. He wanted Huang Xiao to win, as well. It was about asserting glory for his entire race, so he did not particularly care for who the fighter was, he who would take the mantle and responsibility of such a prestigious fight, as long as they won. Shall we establish a wager? Suddenly, a man's voice was heard. Han San and Ji Yan Ran turned around with much surprise to the sight of Tang Zhenliu and Lin Feng. It was Tang Zhenliu who spoke. And what shall we wager? Han Sin Asked, Smi Ling. Let us make a bet on who will win this battle, Tang Zhenliu said. I bet Huang Xiao wins. This isn't a bet, it's a scam, Han Sin said with a wry smile. Tang Zhenliu laughed, then changed the subject. Han Sin, there is something I would like to discuss with you. I was wondering if you might sell me a life geno essence? And if you can't, lend me your super pet so that I might kill a super creature for myself. The prices of such favors are for you to determine. I have one life geno essence I can sell you, but in the sanctuaries, I am a long, long way from home. It will take me a long time to return. Han Sin did not decline, as first generation life geno essences had no value to him. That aside, when the Shura liquid became public, the value of life geno essences would drop as it became easier for others to slay super creatures. Holding on to one now seemed pointless considering what lay ahead. Really? Where are you? Tang Zhenliu asked, visibly happy. Let's watch the match first. We can talk more about this later. When Han Sin turned back to look at the stage, the fight had already started. The rules of this fight stated no one was allowed any form of external support. The battle was to be fought mano a mano, with no weapons or armor or anything else. Humans couldn't use beast souls either, so Huang Xiao swung his fist. When Huang Xiao swung, Han Sun was surprised. He had only just become a surpasser, but still, there was fierce weight and strength driving the fist. Huang Zhao's body glowed with gold like a Buddha in the gleaming light that radiated from his raging fist. The Huang family's golden Buddha may not be very well known, but it cannot be any worse than platinum body. It increases your body's vitality as well as its simple power. He seems calm and composed using it. Perhaps it isn't surprising. When he first became a surpasser, no one could beat him while he used it, Tang Zhenliu explained. Pang, Huang Zhao's fist hit Yu Qielon. The royal Shura did not dodge, but accepted the hit instead. Everyone looked at them with wide eyes, keen to learn the result of the hit. Most people from the alliance believed Huang Xiao had the edge over his enemy. After all, Huang Zhao's fitness level was over 300. This far exceeded Yu Qielon's estimated fitness of 260. By all rights, Huang Xiao should have had a clear advantage over his foe. The result, however, was a little shocking. Yu Qielon somehow evened out the attack, and no damage was delivered to either combatant. In quick retaliation, they both swung their fists. No one expected the fight to be so tense, so shortly after beginning, Yu Qielon and Huang Xiao stood on the spot, their fists flying towards each other in a flurry. The sounds of whipped wind and clubbed bones emanated harshly between the fighters. This is bad. It looks like our intel may have been incorrect. It would seem Yu Qielon's fitness is far higher than what we originally believed it to be. He can compete against Huang Xiao without being at a disadvantage. His fitness must be over 300 for sure. There is no way he can be suppressed or dominated as we initially expected him to be. Tang Yan Li Fao Wen, Han Sin Nid, Tu. The vitality of a royal Shura was naturally very high. 
Huang Shao could only keep up because of his usage of Golden Buddha. Not even ordinary celestial beings were naturally that strong. It seemed as if Yu Qielan hadn't learned any skills to strengthen his body, which was fortunate. But it was frightening to think his body's vitality was on par with Huang Zhao's, despite being all natural. Everyone watched the match intently, all in support of Huang Shao. They earnestly hoped he would beat his foe. I really envy the body of Ashura. If humans were like them, our power in the sanctuary would be unrivaled. An old man spoke enviously as he watched a video stream of the fight. Teacher, do you believe Huang Shao can win? A middle-aged man asked the old man. It is difficult to determine. The old man sighed. The middle-aged man knew the old man very well, but he knew through his response that he actually did not believe in Huang Zhao's ability to triumph over the Shura. The middle-aged man proceeded to say, if there is not much difference between their fitness levels, he could still have a chance. Do not forget, the talents of Ashura rest solely in combat, the old man slowly said. Fists collided against each other in a hailstorm of strikes. Huang Zhao's fist gleamed like a golden hammer. The Shura battled without the flair, elemental, or even magical properties of skills humans employed through their use of hypergeno arts. The Shura only practiced raw power and Yu Qielan used the strength derived from his flesh, muscle, and bone to oppose Huang Zhao's golden lights. For him to break each strike as he was doing, it was a testament to how frighteningly powerful he truly was. It is lucky for us that Huang Xiao was the one chosen to compete with him. If that was me up there, the bones in my hands would have been worn down into dust by now. Tang Zhenliu said, Don't say that. When you become a surpasser, you won't be any worse than Yu Qielan. Lin Feng calmly responded. Can Huang Xiao win this fight? Ji Yinran asked with much worry. Ordinarily, Golden Buddha's defense and durability boons provide its users near unparalleled protection. If this continues, he may very well win. But, Tang Zhenliu was about to say something, but then stopped mid-sentence. His brow furrowed. But what? Han Xin asked. We cannot take stock in any proposed certainties. He is against Ashura. After all, Tang Zhenliu shook his head, as if he regretted having to admit this. Lin Feng then said, I am afraid Huang Xiao may be at a disadvantage. Hansen and Ji Yanran looked shocked upon hearing this, and so Hansen asked, Why? Aren't they fairly balanced? Lin Feng was just about to explain, but as he opened his mouth, a sudden explosion came from the battlefield. The fighters had delivered two extremely powerful punches that, upon collision, sent them both reeling backwards. Yu Qielan looked at Huang Xiao and said, Your fitness is impressive, perhaps the best young humans can provide. But I must regretfully confess to you that you are inferior to us. Huang Xiao coldly replied, I don't think so. Really? Then I'll show you what the Shura are capable of. Yu Qielan's eyes flashed with a purple light. His body suddenly expanded and his muscles doubled in size. The fine and reserved body that once fought against Huang Xiao had been replaced with a hulking beast. The potential power looked frighteningly high, as if he could walk about sundering any stone he pleased. Sure a change. Huang Zhao's face went dim. Sure a change. Everyone else's faces changed at the same time, as well, as they exclaimed the same two words in unison. The visiting Shura looked cocky, satisfied with the reaction they had incited from the human crowd. They were proud of what Yu Qielan had accomplished. What is sure a change? Hansen frowned, having never heard of this before. But seeing Yu Qielan transform, it sent his mind back to zero. There were certain similarities he could not shake. Tang Zhenliu now looked worried, and he explained, sure a change is their form of hypergeno art. It is different than what humans do, however. They don't train and practice with the flow of energy. Again, they exercise the raw nature of their bodies. When they use Shura change, their powers greatly increase. I had believed him to have already used it. I didn't expect him to have been fighting naked previously. Now, I must regretfully confess, Huang Xiao is doomed. As they spoke, Yu Qielan stepped forward. He was much faster now, powered by his incredible muscles. He dashed towards Huang Xiao and threw his fist into his chest. Pang! Huang Xiao used his arm to block the hit, but his body was knocked back four meters as his feet left a deep cleft in the marble plaza they fought upon. Everyone's faces fell. 
The fist was incredibly powerful, and they no longer believed Huang Xiao had what it took to stay competitive. Do you believe me to be stronger than you now? Yu Qianlan did not deliver a follow-up hit. He just spoke in a disdainful manner. Huang Zhao's face contorted for a second, before regaining composure. Coldly he said, Strength is not everything, and I am not yet beaten. As he talked, the gold light that illuminated Huang Zhao's body faded away, and his muscles relaxed. He looked directly into the eyes of his foe. Yu Qianlan smiled and shot another fist in Huang Zhao's direction. This time, he did not want to collide with the punch. Huang Xiao dodged out of its way and quickly tried to deliver a punch of his own into Yu Qianlan's belly. Yu Qianlan threw another fist in an attempt to hurt his human nemesis, but Huang Xiao dodged once more. Like a willow tree in a hurricane, he weaved around to attack from a different angle. Huang Xiao is good. It is no wonder why he was selected to be our champion. As tough as he can be, he can be just as soft. He is smart, as well. Tang Zhenliu had nothing but praise to offer Huang Xiao. Han Sen believed Huang Xiao to be a good fighter, too. A special balance had been wrought inside him, one between his mind and his power. He could time things very well. His judgment and timing could not be any better. Riding on the whims of changing circumstance, he knew when to strike, how to dodge, and which way to move. Although he was losing, his mind still showed confidence, and his resolve was not tarnished by thoughts of defeat. Huang Xiao is a good kid. The old man watched Huang Xiao through the video screen. Teacher, that Yu Qianlan used Shura change to become stronger than Huang Xiao. That is in terms of brute force. With Huang Xiao's intelligence, he can still win, can't he? The middle-aged man asked with a hopeful tone. The old man shook his head and said, Huang Xiao is smart, yes. But it seems we have underestimated the power of this royal Shura. I still don't think he has a chance of being victorious. That being said, the Alliance has many smart young men. We will be stronger than them, in time. After the years that have elapsed, what is a few additional ones in comparison? Teacher, he really doesn't stand a chance, the middle-aged man asked. He thought Huang Xiao should have at least a 30% chance of winning. This match has already been settled the old man coldly said. Huang Xiao, you're doing great. In the plaza, Tang Zhenliu made sure to make his support heard. But Lin Feng said, Huang Xiao is losing though. How? Tang Zhenliu asked with much surprise, not able to believe the words spoken to him. Hansen frowned, as he could tell Huang Xiao was in trouble as well. At the same time, Yu Qianlan took a step back. Then, he spoke to Huang Xiao once more. Are you going to keep on dodging like this? This is a strategy. It is one that takes skill, Huang Xiao calmly responded. Yu Qianlan coldly said, Well, I just want you to know that these cheapo skills are useless before my power. You are a loser, bringing comfort to yourself and nothing more. After he spoke, Yu Qianlan's eyes shone purple again, and blood vessels across his body began to pulsate and stick out. The purple veins decorated each muscle and it was a scary sight to behold. He didn't look handsome anymore. He looked like a real Shura. Boom! Yu Qianlan's body shattered the atmosphere. It was as if he teleported directly in front of Huang Xiao, with his big hand reaching out for the young man's head. Unfortunately, it was too late for Huang Xiao to dodge. It was difficult to comprehend what Yu Qianlan had just done all of a sudden. Whatever it was, his speed had increased exponentially. There was nothing Huang Xiao could do. He gritted his teeth as a golden light enveloped his body. His fist gleamed like molten gold as he cast it forward. He was not aiming to deflect Yu Qianlan's fist, however. He was aiming for his chest. With his life on the line, he was ready to risk it all for the sake of landing one devastating blow. This Wang Xiao is good. Han San and the rest of the crowd were very supportive of his efforts. Huang Zhao's speed and power were lacking against Yu Qianlan, but he was adaptive. If he maintained his defensive posture, he'd be delaying an inevitable loss and would never find a chance to strike back. Huang Xiao knew this all too well, and that was why he decided not to deflect whatever Yu Qianlan was about to do. He knew his strength and speed weren't a match for his opponent, so he was willing to risk it all for any attack he could make. He was not being reckless, though. Huang Xiao was very good when it came to timing, and he had complete control of his body. His strike would surely land no matter what. Even though Yu Qianlan was stronger, 
Huang Xiao could inflict damage of his own. And at the very least, Huang Xiao had Golden Buddha on his side. Although there was a chance of getting severely injured or even dying, Huang Xiao made this decision of his own volition. This was something Han San greatly admired, and he was taken aback by how fearless and devoted to the fight Huang Xiao was. Everyone watched the two fists with their eyes open wide. That single moment seemed to take a lifetime for the people who watched it unfold, hovering at the edge of their seats. This was especially true for the four people who most worried over Huang Zhao's well-being. Their hearts were already pounding heavily, as if for a release from their chests. The demigod human and royal Shura would step in if their people were in danger. But right now, no one knew who was going to emerge victorious. Although the combatants were reaching a critical stage in their fight, all they could do was watch. And furthermore, whichever aid stepped in to help would lead to their fighter's forfeiture. Huang Xiao was already knee-deep in this situation, and stopping him now would be a worse fate than if he were to die. Pang. The moment Huang Zhao's fist struck Yu Chelan's chest, Yu Chelan's fist hit Huang Zhao's head. Arg. Huang Xiao shouted. He fell to the ground with his face drenched in blood, looking grievously wounded. Yu Chelan was hit, but he was still standing tall. He looked at his opponent on the ground with disdain. The demigod stepped forward and called for the immediate aid of a doctor. Everyone's eyes were glued to the stage, and their minds held out hope that Huang Xiao would be okay. Winning was important, but it wasn't worth a young man's life. They all wished him to be fine. Oh, sorry. I believe I may have hit you a little too hard there. Yu Qielan's words may have sounded apologetic on paper, but his arrogant face betrayed their meaning. You have great skill. We lost, the demigod said as he coldly looked upon the Shura. Lin Feng, who was standing next to Han Xian, looked murderous and said, that Yu Qielan must die for this. If I ever meet him again, I will kill him. Why is that? Han Xian looked at Lin Feng. He knew him quite well, and thought what he had said was rather out of character. What had happened had occurred in an established match, after all. This asshole should totally die. Tang Zhenliu was fuming with rage, as well, and the twisted flame of a desire for slaughter was a light in his eyes. Why? Han Xin throve Nid. Let's check on Huang Xiao first. We'll tell you on the way. Lin Feng spoke as they went towards the medical room Huang Xiao was taken to. Tang Zhenliu was furious, angrily grumbling as he walked. That asshole is cheating. What do you mean? Han Xin throve Nid. He had no idea what he meant. He watched the match just as they did and Yu Qielan did not break the rules. There were no weapons employed, either. If he was cheating, Hansen hadn't been able to catch him. Old Han, you have never been to war. You know little about the Shura. They have what is called blood injection. They can inject themselves with the blood of a higher-class Shura to temporarily earn their strength. Me and Old Lin have seen this occur many times. Yu Qielan most certainly used blood injection, Tang Zhenliu explained. Lin Feng's face looked dire. He didn't often get mad, but there he was. He coldly muttered, It was okay of him to use blood injection, as that is how they fight. It isn't too dissimilar to our hypergeno arts. But he held back on it, and did not use it during the beginning. He let Huang Xiao fill himself with false hope. And just as he was willing to give his life for the fight, that was when Yu Qielan unleashed his power. Yu Qielan attempted to murder him. He could have used it during the beginning and brought the fight to a swift end, or many times during the middle, but he committed to using it during a critical, devastating stage where the demigod had no opportunity to stop such damage from being inflicted. Damn it! When Hansen heard the explanation, his new understanding led to him being mad, as well. Hansen had noticed that Yu Qielan became strangely powerful during the final few moments. He thought Yu Qielan was just strengthening his own resolve, and preparing to take the fight a little more seriously. He never expected this was the reality of what he had seen. When the four of them reached the medical bay, the doctors had Huang Xiao in surgery. Many of Huang Zhao's friends nervously awaited him outside. Lin Feng saw a doctor he knew and pulled him aside to ask, Dr. Chan, how is Huang Xiao? Dr. Chan had a wry smile and said, if he was injured anywhere else, we could have done an organ transplant but he received significant blunt force trauma to the head, resulting in severe damage to the brain. He is still in critical condition, 
but our neurosurgeons are doing all that they can to stabilize him. After a pause, Dr. Chan quietly informed Lin Feng. The punch was far too hard. His skull was split, and it was unable to absorb the entire force delivered. This resulted in his brain sustaining severe damage. Even if he survives the nerve damage, the extent of which we will have to determine later, will affect him for the rest of his life. How bad is it? Tang Zhenliu asked. Paralysis is a very serious consequence of such injuries. If the hit was a touch milder, he might only suffer partial mobility disabilities, or only be affected during certain times or under certain conditions. For example, every now and then he might lose control in his hands. But with the way things are looking right now, there is a high chance of the patient suffering intellectual disabilities, Dr. Chan said. When they heard this, each of their faces went dim. This was worse than death for Huang Xiao. Even if his injuries extended no further, he would have lost the ability to fight. It would be impossible for him to adventure through the sanctuaries again. The four of them returned to the plaza in a glum mood. Although they did not really know Huang Xiao, they felt awful upon learning what had happened to him. Please, fulfill your obligation and bring me dollar. He is your strongest young one, after all. Han San, upon his return, Heard Yu Chelon speaking to the receptionist. F asterisk CK. If I was a surpasser, I'd kick his ass so hard. Tang Zhenliu said, angrily. He wished he was a surpasser, for in his present state, he could hardly lay a finger on Yu Chelon. With Shura change and blood injection, Yu Chelon was already able to beat a surpasser that was a celestial being. The hidden power he possessed was something not even Huang Xiao had the ability to overcome. Lin Feng was calm and did not say anything more. The people who knew him well, however, could tell he was suppressing a great fire of anger inside. Han Sen suddenly stood up and walked towards the stage. He was fuming mad, and although he did not know Huang Xiao, he despised Yu Chielon enough to know what he had to do. Furthermore, he had repeatedly asked for a fight against Dollar. Han Sen laughed in his heart and thought to himself, You want to fight Dollar, do you? As you wish. Prepare to get spent. Han Sen, what are you doing? Seeing Han Sen approach the stage, Ji and Ram became incredibly worried. Old Han, do not be reckless. We can kill him together, once we become surpassers. Tang Zhenliu called out. It's only a royal shura. There's no need for me to wait that long, Han Sen said in response, as his fingers glided across Ji and Ran's face. He then told her, Sit right there and wait for me to kill this asshole. After that, Han Sen continued his approach to the stage. Tang Zhenliu still wanted to prevent him from doing this, and Ji Yinran's worry was not alleviated. If he wants to go that much, he must be confident, Lin Feng calmly said, stopping the two from any further attempts to change Han Sen's mind. As Han Sen neared the stage, Yu Chielon was still requesting that someone find Dollar so that they might fight. Yu Chielon, right? Do you have to fight Dollar to feel good about yourself? Han San said, as he ascended the stage and looked directly at his soon-to-be enemy. Everyone's attention now turned to silently focus on Han San, unsure what he was planning to do. Aside from Dollar, what other challenger can I fight who is worth my time? Yu Chielon proudly stated. There were others aside from Huang Xiao that were willing to fight him, but Yu Chielon declined them all. Okay, then, you can fight him. But first, you must beat me, Han Sen calmly said. You? And who are you exactly, chump? I tire of you humans attempting to stall my true desire. How long do you expect me to fight scrawny worthless beings before I can go up against Dollar? Yu Chielon looked at Han Sen with disdain. I lost to Dollar once. Dollar took me out in one and a half punches. If you beat me, I can call upon Dollar to come over here and whip you like a dog. How does that sound? Han Sen looked at Yu Qilan. One and a half punches, huh? Is this guy for real? Yu Qilan ignored Han Sen and spoke to the receptionist directly. Of course, he is my fiancé. He only ever speaks the truth. Ji Yanran stood up and said, President Ji's daughter? Fine, I'll believe you once more. Yu Qilan looked at Ji Yanran and then returned his gaze to Han Senator. He continued by saying, If I win, and I am still unable to see Dollar then tonight's fighting is over. I have no interest in fighting noobs any longer. Han Sen then coldly said, 
Humanity is graced with a desire to uphold their word. Furthermore, we are polite. You allowed Huang Xiao to strike first in the last match, so allow me to return the gesture. Yu Qielon, I want you to make the first attack. Good. If you can withstand one and a half dollar punches, we can quickly determine whether or not you can withstand 1.0 of my punches. Yu Qielon did not waste any time and immediately swung his fist. As he swung, he used Shura Change and the wretched power boosting method of blood injection. He planned to one hit kill Han Sin. Han Sin had started this match, so he couldn't allow himself to immediately get punched and defeated. If the demigod stepped in now, it would be humiliating not only for him, but for humanity as a whole. Such a tale would be laughed about by the Shura for many more generations. It would be a jest, the story of a proud human that sought to start a fight but was knocked out by a single punch in a single second. The demigod was ambivalent and wasn't too sure what to think. They couldn't rightly save him, but they did not want him to be killed. As such, they were unsure about what to do. Hansen is still an evolver. Is he going to be okay? A middle-aged man frowned while watching the video. Unless he is close to the rank of celestial being, even if he was from the Luo family and had learned the falsified Sky Sutra, I do not believe he can beat the Shura. And I say this in the knowledge that the falsified Sky Sutra is an evil and murderous talent. It is truly wicked, but without the necessary power, it won't yield the results he desires. He will die. The old man looked glum as he spoke. He hated Yu Qielan's behavior, and despite his dire prediction, he wanted Han San to win. But the power gulf was very wide, and for Han San to win, it would require nothing short of a miracle. That was why even this old man's predictions were miserable. On another planet, Luo Haiteng watched the fight through a video stream while Luo Li made tea for him. Luo In had not found Han Sin, but Luo Haiteng believed Han Sin carried the blood and genetic qualities of the Luo family. As such, he didn't think Han Sin had what it took to deny the allure of learning the falsified Sky Sutra. Show me how far your practice of the falsified Sky Sutra has come along. Luo Haiteng looked at Han San through the video stream intently, earnestly hoping he would retaliate with the deadly skill. Ji Yinwu and Ji Ruajin were watching the scene, as well, and they looked nervous. Although they had faith in the falsified Sky Sutra, they knew Yu Qielon had blood injection, and they believed the Shura was devastatingly more powerful. The Ning family, the Qin family, the Wang family, the Dong Lin and Zhao families were all watching the same match. They wanted to see what path Hansen had decided to follow. They wondered if he'd be more like Luo Haidang, doing so in a bid to impress everyone. Ji Yin Ran and her friends were extremely anxious. They knew Han San was strong, but they were still worried. The power Yu Qielan possessed exceeded the possible power of an evolver by a great extent. As everyone watched with bated breath, Han Sin did not choose to dodge the punch. Instead, he swung a fist of his own. Han Sen aimed for Yu Qielan's head, electing to risk his life to deliver damage just as Huang Xiao had. Many people believed Han Sen would risk his life. After all, the falsified Sky Sutra could only attack and not defend. And the falsified Sky Sutra delivered frighteningly powerful hits. The manner in which a practitioner could exploit and ravage weak spots was ruinous, but it also made it ineffective against behemoths. On the other hand, whether it was used to fight a human or Shura, the damage it would inflict would be enormous provided that the gulf in power wasn't too much. The falsified Sky Sutra could indeed restrain the Shura, which was something many people acknowledged. But unbeknownst to the others, Han Sin had not practiced the falsified Sky Sutra, so when he swung his fist, many people were shocked at the result. Sonic Thunder Punch? Why not the powers of the falsified sky? The old man was shocked. Didn't he learn the falsified Sky Sutra? The middle-aged man looked confused. Why Sonic Thunder Punch? Yianvu screamed. It was difficult to believe Lady Lan's son did not learn the devastating skill that was the falsified Sky Sutra and instead opted to use Sonic Thunder Punch. Luo Haiteng was the one who was shocked the most, however. Seeing Han Sin not make use of the falsified Sky Sutra, he suddenly stood up, stared at the video, and shouted aloud. Why didn't he use the falsified Sky Sutra? Was Little Lan truly that cruel? Would she favor the death of her son over his learning of the falsified Sky Sutra? 
Luo Haiting believed that Luo Lan must have been the reason why Han Sin had not learnt the skill he wished him to, and that she had outright prevented him. Otherwise, he really would have learned it. And now, without the ability, there was no chance of him competing with Yu Qielan. Using this punch was practically suicide, or so he thought. It wasn't only Luo Haiting who felt this way, either. Many people expected Han San to use it, but were surprised when he did not. At that moment, all their faces turned grim. They believed Hansen had placed himself in a wretched position. No matter how powerful Sonic Thunder Punch was, it was only a hyper Geno art. There was no way it could fathomably be what was needed to go against Yu Chelon. Luo Li was confused, as well. She did not understand why Luo Lan would not have allowed Hansen to practice the falsified Sky Sutra. She thought the reason Han Sen challenged Yu Chielon was because he had learnt the skill and wished to display its power. Only God could have predicted his decision to waltz into such a fight and use Sonic Thunder Punch, of all things. No matter what people thought, however, Han Sen still focused on his casting of Sonic Thunder Punch. Yu Chielon's eyes were full of disdain. The Shura had researched many of the skills and talents humans possessed, and he had seen Sonic Thunder Punch once used in the war. He believed the skill to be useless, and the thunder would have no chance of destroying his body. It wouldn't come close to numbing him either. Yu Chielon had come here to impress all who watched the bouts. If he had not, then he wouldn't have tried to kill Huang Xiao. But now that Han Sen was delivering himself to him, Yu Chielon had no hesitation in exhausting all his force and strength into this one devastating blow. A very strong and fast punch. The other royal Shura continued to watch the fight also of the belief that Han Sen's Sonic Thunder Punch was far weaker than whatever Yu Chielon was about to deliver. It was far slower, and Han Sen's chest would be smashed open before the Sonic Thunder Punch got close. Even if Han Sen could punch Yu Chielon, the power delivered would not be enough to injure him. If Han Sen received a hit, on the other hand, he'd be killed. The demigod still hesitated, unsure whether or not he should step in and save Han Sen's life. It was a tough decision for him to make. The demigod ultimately decided to save Han Senator. It was humiliating, yes, but he did not want to stand by and watch another young man lose his life. But just as he was about to step forward, he noticed something strange and he pulled back. Just as they were about to punch each other, Yu Chielon froze. It was a sudden and short, momentary freeze. In the space of a second, Han Sen's fist sped up and crashed against Yu Chielon's head. Han Sen's eyes flashed blue as thunder flickered across his body. The fist was driven deep into Yu Chielon's forehead. Stop! Upon seeing this, the royal Shura's face completely changed. He wanted to stop Han Sen from delivering his punch, but it was too late. Boom! Han Sen's fist smashed into his opponent's skull. There wasn't much noise, but Yu Chielon's eye sockets began to cascade with blood. The eyes themselves looked ready to eject themselves from the sockets. As blood covered his features, a silver lightning burst forth from his face. Yu Chielon's brain was suddenly turned to mud by the horrible power of the Sonic Thunder mix. His entire body was electrocuted, and as he convulsed, his body continued standing there like a doll. Yu Chielon was strong, but he was not too far off a human. There were parts of his body that were weaker, and just like a human, one was his brain. The way Han San used Sonic Thunder Punch and Ean Force was enough to destroy the skull encased organ. It was payback. Yu Chielon ruined Huang Zhao's brain, and so Han San was delivering Yu Chielon his just deserts. As effective as it was, it worked even better than Han San himself had predicted it would. Yu Chielon's physical abilities were incredible, mostly derived from the blood injection. But while blood injection increased his strength and speed, it did nothing to protect his brain. The royal Shura shouted in his inability to stop Han Senator so. He swung his fist and attempted to attack Han San from behind. What was coming towards Han San now was as powerful a punch as any demigod could deliver. The fact that it was coming from behind as a sucker punch shocked all who watched. They did not expect a royal Shura to commit to such a cheap move, and it was also too late to tell Han San to watch out. The demigod was infuriated by this action and so he leapt into the fray to save Han San from the royal Shura, but it was too late to do so. Not a single person expected the royal Shura to behave in such an obscene fashion. Han Sen's back was facing the royal Shura, 
but it looked as if his back grew a pair of eyes. He stepped forward and grabbed Yu Chielon, who was as responsive as a child's doll. He swung around the lifeless body and presented Yu Chielon as a meat shield to block the Royal Shura's hit. Squash. The Royal Shura almost punched Yu Chielon, struggling to force the wretched power he was about to deliver back inside him. But when that power was pushed back inside, it caused him to cough up blood. All the humans were shocked. They could not believe Han Sin not only punched Yu Chielon and put him in such a state, but was smart enough to evade and force a royal Shura to withdraw his attack. It was like a miracle. Shura, huh? Is that it? Han San threw Yu Chielon, who was still in a vegetative state, away like a piece of trash. He let him twitch and convulse on the ground as he spoke to the royal Shura with disdain. I am going to kill you. The royal Shura was embarrassed, and his rage was inflamed. He looked as if he was preparing to attack Han San again. Please, try to preserve whatever remains of your dignity. The demigod now stood in front of Han Sin with the presence of a mountain. With a look as cold as ice, he spoke to the royal Shura. How dare you kill our royal representative? We Shura will not allow such a slight to slide. This was the human alliance, a stronghold where countless humans lived. The royal Shura's anger had overwhelmed him, and in a place such as this, where he was unable to let loose his violence, all he could do was shout in spite. Please, do not forget it was you who requested peace with us. We did not present you with the idea for a truce. If you choose not to abide to the terms of the treaty we established in our discussions, it is no skin off our nose. The demigod spoke aloud, his response fierce. All the other Shura looked on, unable to say a word. Hansen, follow me in our return. Let us continue the feast. The demigod held onto Han Sen's hand and led him towards the lobby, uncaring for how ill the Shura were looking. Yep, let's celebrate. No one can leave without getting drunk. Tang Jinlio shouted out, as he tugged Lin Feng to follow in the same direction. All the young humans left towards the lobby with great joy, while the Shura grumbled angrily amongst themselves. Not bad. This kid is even more amazing than Luo Haide. He didn't learn the falsified Sky Sutra, and actually used Sonic Thunder Punch to kill Yu Chielon. Ha ha. This truly is impressive. It is amazing. I would love to see the look on Luo Haitong's face right now. A member of the Luo family has turned away from learning their falsified Sky Sutra. Ha 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 ha. The old man was laughing so hard. Tears began to roll. The middle-aged man, by comparison, was frozen. He had followed this man for 40 years, and had never once seen him laugh in such a manner. This kid is really good, little Zhong. I would like to meet him. Can you sort that out for me? The old man had managed to stop laughing, but he was still grinning from ear to ear. Yes, of course, teacher. When Zhong was shocked, as the old man had never requested an audience with someone before. Even if a noble from the alliance came to visit him, he didn't spare the time of day to see them. Now, not only did he want to meet Han San, he was willing to go out and pay him a visit himself. Luo Haiteng wore a complicated grimace as he sat there in silence. He gazed into the paused video with eyes that did not blink. Luo Li stood in the corner of the room, not willing to speak a single word. She even breathed as gently as she could, not wishing to disturb or rouse the ire of Luo Haiteng. She had not seen him in such a state for many years. The last time he appeared like this, he went to a spirit shelter and battled for four days straight in a bid to conquer it. Why did he not learn the falsified Sky Sutra? After the long silence, Luo Haiting broke it with this simple sentence, in a voice that trembled with depression. Old Han, good job. I have never given you the admiration you deserve before, but this time I do. This time I really, really do. Here, I am going to drink in your honor. Cheers. Tang Jinlio devoid of all manners, picked up two cups and filled them both up with wine. He presented one cup to Han San and lifted one cup to his own lips. Quickly, he gulped it down and shouted, Awesome! Never since leaving the battlegrounds have I felt so awesome. Awesome, yep, awesome. If this was an average feast, Tang Jinlia would have been thrown out on his backside by now already. But today, the higher-ups did not care and allowed him to be as big a clown as he desired. All the young people were tremendously excited, 
surrounding Han San in celebration of his deed. They weren't going to let him leave without getting him drunk. Ji Yin Ran, seeing him surrounded by people who were praising his actions, felt overjoyed and proud for him. Of course, most of her joy came from seeing him emerge from the scrap with Yu Chielan unscathed. The fact that she had an excellent, truly powerful boyfriend came second to his safety. Still, who didn't want a hero boyfriend? Although such things were not incredibly important to Ji Yen Ran, she was starting to feel as if her dreams were coming true. Han San was not very good at drinking. It wasn't long before he could not consume any more, and the alcohol had made his head heavy and his stomach upset. It wasn't easy to escape the hounding crowd. He attempted to find somewhere to hide, and just as he found a place, Lin Feng appeared before him out of nowhere, presenting him with another full glass. He said, Cheers, brother. Han Sen stood in front of Lin Feng, frozen for three whole seconds. Then, he said, Blarg, and puked all over him. Tang Zhenliu, who was catching up from behind, froze as well, all for different reasons, of course. He had never seen Lin Feng in such a mess before, and even across bloody battlefields he had never appeared so disheveled and dirty. Lin Feng was a tidy person, who desired everything to be perfect. When his girlfriend visited his house, she had to remove her shoes, take off her coat, and not lay a finger on any of his belongings. He once had another girlfriend, but he broke up with her after she sat on his clothes by accident. He could never look at her straight after that. Now that Lin Feng had puke all over him, fresh from Han Sen's gut, Tang Zhenli couldn't fathom how he might react. Will old Lin start a fight with old Han? And if so, who should I support? Bah, who cares? It would only be a fight between two elites. I can't care too much about something like that. Tang Zhenliu's mind raced over the different scenarios that might soon unfold, and then suddenly started to think, fight him. Come on, fight him. Seeing Lin Feng move, reaching his hand out towards Han Sun, the excitement inside Tang Zhenliu reached greater and greater heights each passing second. Now, his mind said, that's it, they're going to fight. A fight is about to start. They're going to fight. But again, Tang Zhenliu was delivered a shock that froze him absolutely still. He was so surprised that his eyes almost popped out. Lin Feng, after reaching out his hands, did not hit Han Senator. All he did was take off his puke-covered coat and put it aside. Then he hugged Han San, who looked ready to pass out and hit the deck. After that, he dragged him towards a room and shut the door. Holy smokes! Are my eyes screwed in right? That couldn't have been Lin Feng. The last time I got drunk in his house, that asshole threw me out the door and made me sleep out in the rain. Han Sin didn't just get drunk, he threw up all over him. And now he is being hugged and taken to a private room? This cannot be. Tang Zhenliu rubbed his eyes repeatedly, but regardless of who else he thought it might be, deep down he knew that it was undoubtedly Lin Feng. There was no public stream, so ordinary folks of the Alliance were unable to watch the fight. But still, news of the fight leaked to the press and caused a grand, delightful shock for the populace. Hearing Han Sen killed the Royal Shura Yu Chelon in a single punch and made a Royal Shura elite cough up blood put Han Sen's name on the tip of everyone's tongue. It was the first time his name had true relevance in the alliance. Every media outlet reported on the event, how a man in his twenties effortlessly beat a Royal Shura. To humanity, this was a tremendously exciting affair. Han San, furthermore, was the future son-in-law of the president. Due to his prestige, all the citizens of the alliance developed a keen interest in him. They wanted to learn every detail they could about him, large and small. Many people even questioned the manners and etiquette he employed when visiting the bathroom. Han San had been born into an ordinary family, but his father died while he was still young. Therefore, he was raised primarily by his mother. He initially went to a public school, but after much struggle, managed to enter a high-class military school. That was where he met the president's daughter, from which they ignited a spark and kindled a romance. From a middling, lowly heritage to one of great renown, his life was the perfect example of a classic success story. Onwards and upwards, his life and prestige did not seem to slow down. Lin Feng went to visit Huang Xiao numerous times, and when he came this time, he brought with him a demigod healer to aid in his restoration. Over a short amount of time, 
His wounds sealed and the previous damages weren't very visible. The Alliance did everything they could to reduce the damages he suffered, but not all their efforts were successful. His brain had received a cruel amount of damage, and many parts of it had been utterly destroyed, beyond healing or repair. Neither technology nor skills could help. Because of this, Huang Zhao's body suffered a number of problems. However, the efforts of the Alliance that were focused on minimizing his lasting disabilities were mostly a success. The biggest problem that remained was his movement. While most of his body functioned correctly, there were occasional issues with his movement that could not be solved or overcome. For example, when he wanted to reach into his pockets, he had trouble guiding his hands into the entrance of his pockets accurately. To a fighter of such caliber, this was disastrous. Do not worry for my future well-being. While my body may remain permanently damaged, my mind and my consciousness are the same as they always have been. Even if I can't fight anymore, I can put this battered brain to use elsewhere. Huang Xiao was more optimistic than was expected. He hadn't been emotionally crushed by what had transpired, and when he spoke, a fire was still alight in his eyes. They told everyone that what he was saying was most earnest and true. After the fight, Hansen had indeed become rather famous. His feet made others acknowledge his true fitness level, and people now knew it had to be at least over 200. But people also knew that it was impossible for evolvers to go that high unless he had somehow managed to absorb life geno essences and had earned himself super geno points. People frequently discussed all sorts of topics relating to Han senator officers, on the other hand, were only thinking and whispering of a way in which they might get him to reveal his secret to absorbing life geno essences. Han Sen's communicator hadn't stopped ringing since the night of the fight, so he turned it off. But when he refused to allow his communicator to keep ringing, the same could not be said for others of the G family. The rest of the family was pestered by people who wanted Han Sen's knowledge. The reason Ji Ruajin became president was not his own power. He had ties and alliances to many factions, families, and organizations in high places. As a result, he could not deny their requests. Ji Ruajin went to talk with Han Sen and asked him about it. Regardless of whether or not he had absorbed life geno essences, he had to appease the alliance with an answer. He couldn't ignore their inquisitiveness forever. Han San did not hesitate or lie in his response. Quickly and affirmatively, he said, I have obtained super geno points, yes? When Han San went to fight Yu Chelon, he deliberated the consequences of revealing so much. Ji Ruajin's question did not come as a surprise, and so Han San's response was prepared. Ji Ruajin fell silent upon hearing Han Sen's confirmation. After a certain amount of time elapsed, he said to Han Sen, Tell me what you can. Han Sen smiled and said, There is no secret. It is easy to obtain super geno points. You simply need to find the eggs of a super creature, one that is semi composed inside its shell. Eat it, and you will receive super geno points. That is where I get mine from. Really? Ji Ruajin asked, shocked. He did not expect the answer to be so simple. On my own life, I pledge to you that this is not incorrect, Han Sun said. Good. This is an important discovery, and one that means a lot to the future progression of humanity. Ji Ruajin did not stop there, and he continued by saying, Do not worry any further. The Ji family will handle all the matters pertaining to this revelation, and the benefits you will receive for this discovery will not disappoint you. Hansen hadn't planned on receiving any rewards, particularly so since he didn't admit the entire truth. And what's more, obtaining the eggs of a super creature was a good deal harder than killing a super creature outright. Super creatures were not difficult to locate in the Second God Sanctuary, but eggs most certainly were. If people wanted to spend their time searching for them, Hansen didn't believe their efforts would get in his way too much. The chances were extremely low that someone would be lucky enough to find such an egg, and further yet managed to kill the super creature that was guarding it. And maxing out super geno points by going for eggs alone seemed impossible. Back in the sanctuary, Han Sun made plans to leave Moment Shelter. He wanted to look for another human shelter so he could finish his deal with Tang Zhenliu by selling him the life geno essence. After leaving the mountain ranges, it wasn't too long before he found a human shelter where he could finish the transaction. The Tang family gifted him ownership of a whole rare metal mine. It was not Z-Steel, 
But the Z-alloy you could get from the mine was quite important to have. It was expensive, and people were still figuring out the qualities and properties of the alloy. As such, the price was still on the rise. Inside the Angel Gene office, Zhao Seven spoke to someone. In the image on screen stood the royal Shura that had tried to attack Han San after the bout. Mr. Zhao, to complete our contract we had to sacrifice one of our royal members. Shouldn't you do something about this? The royal Shura said to Zhao Seventh. Zhao Seventh coldly responded, Preventing the establishment of peace is our ultimate goal, and that is not just because of me. Furthermore, Yu Qianlan's death was a result of his own recklessness. That is no responsibility of mine. Mr. Zhao, our friend cannot have been slain in vain. Think on it some more, because if you don't make the right decision, we may have to end our cooperative venture, the royal Shura said firmly. Zhao Seventh frowned, and a look of anger and scorn consumed his face. It was only for a moment, and then it left as quickly as it came. He smiled and said, General Sha Hong, what is it that you want? I don't care how it is achieved, but the person that slew one of ours has to pay. Han Zen Musti. Sha Heng's face grimaced with the ugly look of murder. No problem. That can be arranged without difficulty. Give me a month, and by the end of that time frame, Han Sen will be gone from the face of this world. As for the latest package, please have it delivered on time, Zhao Seventh said. I will await your good news. Until then, consider our deal of cooperation terminated, Sha Hung said. Fine. Zhao Seventh smiled. After their communication, Zhao Seventh smiled. He called up Zhao Lian and coldly told him, Take our people to planet Dong Long, rob their supplies, and kill the Shura there. Zhao Lian was shocked at the sudden order and asked, Chairman, doesn't that mean we will end up as their enemies? What will happen to our supplies in the future? They are not the only royal Shura there. If our arrangement with them comes to an end, I am sure another family will be eager to take their place. Zhao Seventh coldly smiled. Hansen ventured back into the mountains in the hopes of tracking more super creatures. Although there were many super creatures, he couldn't just go for any. Furthermore, he had to find second generation ones, which greatly narrowed those he could deem to be appropriate targets. When will I be able to take down the Devil Blood King's shelter? There must be many second generation super creatures in a place such as that. Hansen thought about the prospect with greed, but they were thoughts and nothing more. With his power at its current level, he knew that he would be unable to deal with so many super creatures all at once. Thoughts and fantasies of such a daring venture were all he could conjure about it. Exiting a particular valley, Hansen noticed he was leaving the mountain ranges behind him. Having searched all that time, he felt disheartened at his inability to locate a second generation super creature. Just under 40 super geno points to go until I can max it out. Hansen was hoping to become a surpasser sometime soon as he was too weak right now and could not compete with the elites of the Alliance. He used all the strength he possessed to take down Yu Chielon, and he had to make use of the power of the Devil Eye Spider. With it, he tricked the Shura's mind for a single moment, enough for Han Sin to deliver the blow that destroyed the royal's brain. If he hadn't done that, then a victory was most certainly not an assured thing. If he became a surpasser, however, such a fight would have been easy. Killing anyone of similar strength would be a trivial accomplishment with the power he'd possess. Leaving the craggy slopes of the mountains behind him, he found himself in the midst of verdant expanses and emerald pastures. The fields were still on a bit of a slant, but they were decorated with an abundance of plants. On the grassy fields, Han San saw a single creature chasing away a whole group of lesser creatures. They were like sheep being herded, and there were many of them. The creature that chased them had six legs and two arms. It was a curious-looking thing, and it was difficult for him to discern what it was or think of another creature that it resembled. Seeing its life force, he realized that it was a sacred blood creature. Han Sen wasn't interested in killing sacred blood creatures, so he planned to fly past the ongoing kerfuffle and save himself the time and energy it would take to dispatch them. But as Han Sen flew over, the silver fox leapt off his shoulder. After it landed, it took off running towards the strange monster. Little Silver hopped onto the monster and quickly electrocuted it, and seeing it do so made Han San quite confused. Little Silver never aggressively attacked a creature of its own volition, 
so he was uncertain why it was doing so now. The sheep-like creatures were weird, too. Their life forces were mostly ordinary, and the strongest amongst them were mutant. Queerly, none of the creatures seemed to flee the silver fox's presence. After the silver fox slew the monster, it did not proceed to slay the sheep. Instead, all it did was gaze at them from afar. Hansen could only guess why. With a puzzled expression, Hansen went over to the silver fox and squatted by its side to watch the sheep, just as his little pet did. Then Hansen saw something weird. Ordinary creatures rarely ate plants, or food in general. Only the children of creatures traditionally ate plants, and they were usually super creatures. But the herd of sheep that Hansen watched graze was entirely composed of ordinary and mutant creatures. It was a curious sight watching them lower their heads to the ground and consume grass. But aside from that one strange aspect, nothing else stood out to Han Senator for all intents and purposes, they appeared to be sheep and nothing else. Little Silver, it is time for us to go. When Han San told the Silver Fox it was time to leave, it didn't budge. All it did was continue to lie on the grass and watch the sheep. There was nothing Han San could do about its stubborn refusal to leave. So all he did was return to the silver fox and continue watching the sheep alongside it. Although it appeared it be nothing, he started to suspect the silver fox had made a discovery of some sort, and Han San simply hadn't yet seen it. They spent half the day watching the little creatures, and the entire time they watched, the sheep remained in the area, merrily grazing the hours away. When the sun looked about to set, the sheep began to relocate. One sheep took the lead and it led them directly up the mountains Hansen had just come down from. The silver fox followed them, and Hansen followed the silver fox. Not long after, the sheep entered a valley that was sealed on one end. But this seemed to be where the sheep lived. The silver fox sniffed the ground all around like a little pig, which amused Hansen. But Hansen understood this behavior was abnormal for the silver fox. It only behaved like this if it had found something. Therefore, he gave it the time it needed. Is there treasure to be found here, in the mountains? Han San bore a look of deep contemplation, but then, he saw the silver fox hasten its pace and proceed further into the valley. Han San snapped out of his thoughts and quickly ran to catch up. The silver fox sniffed the ground all along the way, as if it were in search of something. The sheep didn't seem aggressive, and when the duo approached them, all the sheep did was run away. They they watched the two that had come to their valley. It is fortunate that they live here, and there are no humans around. They'd all have been slain. If humans were out and about these regions, Han Sen thought to himself. Little Silver continued on its way into the deeper recesses of the valley. It seemed to have been led to the face of a cliff, and it began scraping the stone with its claws. There was a very thin crack where the silver fox was digging. Nothing, save something with the width of paper would be permitted entry into that crack. What are we doing here? Han San approached the wall and took a look at what the silver fox was trying to dig through. From the small crevice, a sort of liquid leaked. It looked like it was providing moisture to the plants in the area, allowing them to grow more quickly. The hasty silver fox had managed to dig a two-meter hole into the ground. At its bottom, it opened up into a cave. It was massive, and the cavern was furnished with a grand number of stalactites. It was rather humid inside. And in there, you could also hear the constant sound of water dripping. Han San saw much water drop from the tips of the stalactites, adding to a pool that had formed below them. The water that babbled out of the mountain must have come from this pool, but it didn't look like anything special. The silver fox approached the pool and circled it numerous times, as if he was looking for something specific. Han San followed the silver fox, but before he joined it at the side of the pool, the silver fox turned around, showed its teeth to its master, and growled. Don't be so selfish. Even if you have located something decent, I won't steal it from you. Hansen might have said that, but it was just a lie. In his heart, he contemplated the manner in which he might steal whatever goody the silver fox was searching for. But still, with the silver fox behaving that way, Hansen stayed his approach. He stood a small distance away and observed the silver fox, hoping to catch a glimpse of what it was searching for. Not long after, Han San noticed the reason the silver fox had shooed him away. It wasn't because of greed. It was because there was something in the pool that was living. 
Little Silver was warning him. Hansen didn't realize this at first, but when the silver fox stopped to observe the pool, he noticed something was amiss. In the pool, in the direction the silver fox was looking, swam a fish. The fish wasn't very large. In fact, it was only about 10 centimeters long, and it was semi-transparent. The bones were transparent, as well, and the only way you could properly catch sight of it was by spotting its blood vessels. If you didn't peer at the water carefully and look for it that way, you wouldn't notice it existed at all. Because of the water, Han San was unable to sense its life force. Instead, he summoned his devil eye mask and managed to espy the presence of a flame on the fish. It was its life force, and it burned as hot as any other super creatures did. That little thing is a super creature? Hansen felt a mixture of shock and confusion. The energy inside the little fish was blurry, so it was only a first-generation super creature. And since the fish did not appear to possess the elemental properties of thunder, Hansen wondered why the silver fox seemed to show so much interest. The silver fox lay down near the pool and did not move. After a while, it began circling the pool as it had when it first arrived. The little blighter almost seemed to be lost in thought. What does he want? Han San said to himself, as he observed the silver fox. If the silver fox wanted to kill the fish, then it could have very well done so. The pool wasn't very deep, only about three feet deep at the very most. He could even effortlessly electrify the water with lightning, without a single worry about aquatic retaliation. Plus, Han Sen was there. If the silver fox wanted to attack and felt that it needed backup, surely it knew its master wouldn't sit idly by watching it tussle with the fishy wretch all by itself. But all the silver fox did was lie down near the pool again. It watched the little transparent fish swimming around and did nothing at all. Han San was very curious what was going on, but there was nothing he could do. He could only wait. If he got close to the pool, the silver fox would approach Han San and make a fearsome face. Understanding how powerful his pet had gotten, Han San wasn't willing to take any chances with somehow invoking the ire of the silver fox. Not long after, a sheep entered the cave the silver fox had dug. It didn't seem to be afraid of people, and it strutted right over beside Han San. When the sheep saw the pool, it bought. It walked towards the pool as if it were thirsty and fancy to drink. Han Sen thought the silver fox was going to stop it, but it didn't. It continued to lie where it was, watching the sheep quench its thirst at the pool. Han Sen thought the fish might have been angry at this intrusion, but it didn't have any negative reaction. In fact, it didn't look as if the fish cared at all. It continued to swim as mellowly as it had the entire time. The sheep drank quite a bit, and once it was done, it turned around and prepared to leave. But what Han Sun saw next was a most terrifying scene. The sheep's mouth began to rot, and bits of sizzling flesh fell to the ground below. To make it all the more unnerving, the sheep acted as if it had not noticed a thing. It wasn't in pain or anything, and it merely continued to trot back towards the outside as casually as it had entered. While it walked, more of its flesh fizzled away from its face, coating the cavern floor in blood. It began to happen elsewhere on its body, as goopy chunks of its flesh slid free from the bones of the sheep they once composed. It wasn't long until parts of its skeleton were exposed. The sheep continued walking to the exit, and by the time it left the cave, it was nothing but a skeleton. In a grisly, horrific mess, its organs lay scattered and strewn all about. Seeing the sheep walk outside alive, with only its bones to indicate what it was, Han San could hardly believe his eyes. Han San was given a cold sweat, seeing this, and now, he quickly understood why the silver fox did not want him to approach. The liquid in that pool was by no means a consumable refreshment. For the fish itself to survive inside there, it had to be a miracle. Then, from outside the cave, a chorus of buying could be heard. Han San quickly ran out and saw that all the other sheep were frightened and trying to avoid the sheep that was now just a skeleton. But it really did seem as if the skelly sheep hadn't noticed anything amiss, and it continued to believe it was the same as the rest of its fluffy companions. It tried following the other sheep around, unaware of why it was being avoided. As the skelly sheep followed them around, however, it wasn't long before Han San heard something snap. Several of its bones broke, and it collapsed on the ground. 
What the H asterisk LL is the water in that pool? Han Sian thought to himself, in utter disbelief at the ghastly sight he had just witnessed. When he returned to look at the creepy pool, his heart pounded with fear. Han Sian sniffed the air and did not notice anything that smelled amiss, so at the very least it wasn't a natural acid. It seemed as if the water came from the stalactites above. A pool had formed from the constant dripping. Han Sen looked up and noticed a number of cracks inside the stalactites, indicating the water must have leaked out from inside them. But the amount of water coming from them was very little. There were ten stalactites, and there was only one drop every few minutes. God only knew how many years it would have taken for the pool to be created. Little Silver, if you keep waiting here, it'll all be for nothing. If you want this fish out of the pool, don't expect it to do so by itself. Perhaps we should bang our heads together and think of a way in which we can get it out ourselves, eh? Han San spoke to Little Silver as he continued to lie prone, watching the fish. The Silver Fox then turned around and looked at Han San, as if he was expecting Han San to suggest a plan. Use your thunder. Electrify the water. Spook it out. And then grab it. Han San suggested after a short period of thought. The silver fox looked at Han San with disdain. It cast lightning out onto the surface of the water, but it didn't seem to do anything. It appeared as if it dissolved when it came into contact with the curious liquid of the pool. Now Han San understood the look he had been given, realizing the lightning could not penetrate the surface of the water. What is this water then? What makes it behave like that? Han San was shocked. Well, that's okay. If the thunder is absorbed by the water, I'd like to see it absorb this. As Han Sen's dialogue came to a close, he quickly summoned his peacock crossbow, loaded it with raw Z steel bolts, and took aim at the fish in the pool. The silver fox's eyes opened wide and it retreated a few steps, expecting Han Sen to kill the fish. Approaching the pool a little closer, Han Sen corrected his aim to obtain perfect accuracy on the fish. He predicted its movement and then pulled the trigger. But when the bolt pierced the water, he somehow missed. The surface of the pool was mirror-like, giving a reflection far clearer than average water would. Therefore, the fish's position in the water was different than it appeared. The bolt missed and lodged itself inside the rocky bottom of the pool. This made Hansen feel pretty bad. The water was terrifying, and Hansen didn't think he could retrieve the Z-Steel raw bolt with any modicum of ease. But he didn't dwell on it too much but instead retrieved another Z-steel bolt and took aim at the fish once more. Han San calculated its path and took into account the refraction of the water. But the bolt pierced the water and the fish's body. Its body did not resist the flight of the bolt in the slightest, and all it did was twitch a little before flipping over dead. It died. As simple as that. Han San threw se. He did not expect the creepy fish to die so easily. There was no struggle and it was killed with a single shot. 